then Kale, our brave hero, and his entire hometown of Dragon City got taken into a new world, one where large flying spaceships rule the sky and steel robots rule the land. In this tumultuous new world, super beings fight against demons for territory using everything they have, all to no avail. The monster's raid still takes place and Dragon City falls like a bad game of giant Jenga. Our boy, having sworn an oath of service, promises to protect Dragon City to the best of his ability, remake the civilization, and slaughter all the demons and ancient gods disturbing his once beautiful new world. A flowery blue beast with a mouth for a head tears its way through the super beings trying to fight it. They yell to be saved, they scream for help, but it's unfortunate that help doesn't come in time for them to be saved. Dragon City has fallen, or so they thought. Our boy is tired but undeterred as he wields two half-swords and charges into a horde of incoming monsters. He laments with a bloodied mouth that it's just impossible to get rid of all of them. This doesn't stop him from diving into their midst and cutting up as many as are unfortunate to taste the wrath of his blade. Mankeo beheads a monster about ten times his size only to get crushed by a flaming golem. He lets out a scream as blood accompanies it out his mouth. The golem, with eyes like a villain from the Book of Revelations, then mercilessly flings the whole of Mankeo into the ground, with enough force to make our boy super dizzy. He staggers to his feet, blood dripping down his head and shirt. In fact, if you didn't know him to be a hero, you would easily mistake him for a zombie survivor. Still in a daze, our boy wonders if he can go on. The monster he had previously beheaded stays dead in the distance as a certain red essence emanates from its neck in the form of vines. These vines suddenly shoot out and make their way towards an unexpecting mankale like a wolf's claws to its unfortunate prey. They stab right through him, making him cough up even more blood. It's now obvious that he's running out of this red essence. The vines lift him into the air, and amidst the pain, he whispers to his parents that he tried his best. As the world around him lays in turmoil, a dying Mankeo is the least happy about it. He watches as mighty balls of flame fall from the sky and consume his beloved city. It turns out our boy has been having a nightmare this whole time. In reality, Mr. Yan is busy waving an antique sword and yelling at the rest of the class to look at him. The students at the front seat don't mind the educator as they continue their incessant conversations. Mr. Yan angrily repeats that they look at him, but our boy is still deep in his slumber, reliving a world where all his friends die, and he watches the city he loves go up in not-so-proverbial flames. With an infuriating look on his face, and quite the pulsating forehead vein, Mr. Yan taps the sword against the skull of a beast. He asks his students how they expect to know how monsters look if they do not look at his example. Some of his students burst out laughing, others still don't mind him even when he yells for them not to laugh. Mankeo suddenly jolts awake, with an unflattering sleep mark on his right cheek and unfiltered shock in his eyes. The girl sitting in front of him spins her head of blonde hair to look at our boy, and makes it a point to tell him that he must have slept like an idiot. To him, she's just classmate number one, with a really condescending look on her face. Mankeo zones her out as he looks at both his hands, just to confirm that he is not dead. Out of the corner of his eye, he catches a glimpse of the blackboard in the distance. On it, the professor had written that they have only 50 days until the national college exam alongside some motivation for them to study well, make progress every day, and dominate the other world. With the sleep mark still on his face, our boy is shocked as exam realization hits him. He turns his gaze back to what's in front of him, wondering why he's not dead, wondering why he returned to his third year in school. He gets wide-eyed as the worst realization hits him. Our sweet boy is about to take on the national college exam, a fate he considers worse than death. Mr. Yen yells from the front, calling Meng Kao's name. Ironically, he tells him not to disturb the class by sleeping. Our boy doesn't know when he screams, asking his teacher if he's sure he's not dead. Mr. Yan confirms that he's very much alive, but this leaves a heavy note of weirdness in the air. So much so, that the whole class turn around and stare blankly at Meng Kao. His chubby best friend, Chu Feixing, gives him a thumbs up, as he thinks to himself that they'll give Meng Kao, who also happened to be the strongest in class 6, a befitting burial. This is because he and almost all the students have concluded that Mr. Yan will kill Meng Kao. True to their thoughts, the teacher breaths heavily as he asks our boy if he would care to explain himself. He curses in this part, but in essence, he realizes how screwed he is. Our boy immediately pushes his chair away, flinging it ways away from himself as he bows his head to apologize to the teacher. He tells Mr. Yan that he only had a nightmare and begs for his forgiveness. The teacher takes his time processing this but Meng Kao continues to explain in the meantime. He elaborates about dreaming that overwhelming alien creatures breached the Dragon City, and the century-old homeland had gotten destroyed before he woke up from the shock. With his head still bowed, he tells Mr. Yan that he was quite brave in his dream and was respected as a martyr. The teacher has an unholy smirk on his face as he summarizes what Meng Kao said and pushes forward the monster skull he has in his left palm. Our boy has a quick flashback, remembering how Mr. Yan was faced with a huge alien worm with four sets of carnivorous teeth. He then tells the teacher that he shouldn't worry, because he had a peaceful death, when in truth, Mr. Yang got torn into shreds within a few seconds, thanks to the worm monster. 
Meng Kao has his hand on his chin as he concludes that his teacher must have not felt any pain. Because of this, the vein on Mr. Yan's head almost ruptures. He shatters the monster skull in one go, declaring that the end of Dragon City is a ridiculous thing to say. Our boy gets a finger pointed at him from none other than the gray-haired Mr. Yan. Alongside this, he's given impossible instructions to stand against the wall with his head up, chest out, stomach in, and ass out. Trust Meng Kao to try his best to be obedient. He basically has the spotlight as he looks ridiculous obeying his teacher. He then asks how he's supposed to have his ass out with his back against the wall. Mr. Yang glares at him through his glasses and Meng Kao shuts up immediately. Slowly, the teacher moves to the back where our boy is standing, and asks him to answer loudly as he brings up what happened in Dragon City 50 years ago. The city had been moved to another world and got tormented with plagues and zombies that rampaged through their land. Mr. Yan would like Meng Kao to tell him if the city perished then, and that was just question one. For the second instance, he reminds our boy of when the fog arrived and monsters appeared after the zombie disaster. He reminds of when countless martyrs were willing to sacrifice their lives for them to wrench spaces for the people of Dragon City to escape the teeth of the monsters. He's now face to face with our boy and yells at him, asking if the city submitted to the monsters then, asking if Dragon City was destroyed then. Mr. Yan is so close to Meng Kao's face that his spit could make contact with the poor boy's eyes. A very scared Meng Kao stands at attention, and responds at the top of his lungs that the city did not submit, and neither was it destroyed. The gaze of the entire class had escorted Mr. Yan to the back. He then breaks into a small speech about the city's steel army marching forth with the momentum of tigers descending from the mountains. With conviction dripping from his tone, he claims that they will spread the glory of Earth's culture to the other world. He then asks how Dragon City could be destroyed by the creatures of this other world when they're in this state. Mr. Yan is nothing if not convinced that Earthlings are the most ruthless in this world. The other students get fired up too as quips of agreement fly in the air like fireworks you like but don't really care for. One of them declares that Earth is the most brutal, and another thinks that Earth will wipe out the other world in no time. The fire in their eyes is quite commendable but then comes the soft-spoken class rep, Zuo Heorin. He gently tells his teacher that what he has said is true and valiantly proclaims that they should study well and train hard to become superhumans so they can contribute to the rise of Dragon City. Still in the spirit of valiance, he asks the class and by extension, the Earth, how they could be scared of enemies as though they were fearsome tigers. He asks how they could even be wondering about the destruction of Dragon City. Zuo Heorin looks straight at Menkeo as he declares that he believes only a few people are cowardly. Our boy awkwardly points towards himself as if to ask whether the class rep is referring to him. He gets dismissed and Zuo Heoran quips with his hands emphatically raised, that most of the students are thinking about the same thing, that Dragon City will definitely win, that Earth will definitely win. He gets the whole class to chorus his last words, well, all except Chu Feixing and Meng Kao. The class rep has his personal fan club of ladies and they put on quite the show, intertwining their hands until they form the heart symbol. They chorus how handsome he is, while another says Meng Kao has fallen to the slumps recently and just keeps sleeping in class. You can count on women to keep up the banter as another quips that they shouldn't blame our boy because something went wrong with his cultivation, and heavily injured him. She points out how he fell from first place to last place and her friend puts the icing on this terrible kick, telling Meng Kao not to curse Dragon City to be destroyed. Our boy's eyes go dead instantly, as he wonders whether Zuo Heorin has a grudge against him. He scratches that and concludes that they have a grudge against each other. You see, in Meng Kao's previous life, the class rep had made him miss his entrance exams by plunging a hole right through our boy's chest. Worse off, he did it with a smile so sinister, you could tell that he had been planning it. It's no surprise that he ended up being a coward and a snitch. Zuo Heorin had fled from battle when Dragon City clashed against a true civilized race and began a difficult war against it. The boy had shamelessly gone on his knees, offering up information in exchange for his safety. Our boy looks at the class rep from the corner of his eye and runs close enough to him before calling him out. When he stands face to face with him, the rep can tell that Meng Kao looks totally different from before. He's stunned at first but our boy shoots him a sinister smile before doing the exact opposite of what the rep expected. Meng Kao tells him that what he said was right and that he's so moved by the lesson Zuo Heorin had taught him. He then thanks him and Mr. Yan for pointing out his mistakes before promising to be firm in his stance and train hard. All of this is so our boy can contribute to Dragon City's rise to power in this world. He bows his head and declares that he's ready to give his full strength for it. He's quite impressed, he's halfway bald, he's Mr. Yan. The man finally speaks, telling Meng Kao to learn more from Zuo Heorin. He then instructs our boy to head to the back of the class and showcase his dragon hibernation stance until the class ends. It's not as interesting as it sounds, you can tell by the unenthusiastic yes that Meng Kao gives his teacher. Chu Feixing turns to look at him, wondering to himself that Meng Kao couldn't possibly do the stance because he hasn't been doing the nine great stances lately. He thinks our boy will have to crawl home after doing the hibernation stance for just 30 minutes. To Meng Kao, the stance is beyond simple and had even gone obsolete in his nightmare. He scratches his head as he asks the teacher how to stand. 
The other students use this as a yardstick to mock him. They tell him to stop pretending to be cool and just beg for mercy. Another person snickers, claiming that he has never seen such a good actor and that they'll see how Mankeo will crawl out. The third dork in their trio quips that Mr. Yan's punishment is too lenient. As Mankeo stretches at the back, Zuo Hyorin calls him the bad egg in the batch and claims that the punishment serves him right. Our boy gives a smirk that tells you that something's coming. He raises his leg emphatically, claws both his hands, putting one in front of him and one behind and easily strikes the dragon hibernation stance. He has his head down but we all know it's for dramatic effect. Anyway, it works. Mr. Yan is the first to be surprised. The three dorks are a very close second. They all have their eyes wide, as dork number one tries telling himself that it's an illusion, claiming that Mankeo is using his life to pretend like he's cool and won't last a minute. Dork number two declares that our boy's pose is even better than that of the class rep. As for dork number three, that one's just left in shock. He's just wondering how Mankeo's pose is that good. Our boy modestly smiles at Mr. Yan and apologizes for his movements not being perfect. He attributes it to having not practiced in a while and promises to change it when he goes back. The teacher just ignores him and tells the other students that they'll be returning to the lecture. The three dorks whisper that Mankeo's stance and ability to act cool suddenly increased after he woke up. With a calm exterior and the most sinister thoughts, Zuo Heorin plots to make our boy regret embarrassing him. Meanwhile, Mankeo notices something during his pose, something that gets his eyes shining the gold of the afternoon sun. He wonders what it could be, only for a console to pop up before him. It indicates that it's loading for some time before finally displaying that kindling has been bound successfully and the host's identity has been verified as Mankeo, the fire relayer. The scene is enthralling, a small flame amidst a cosmos-like setting. Mankeo recognizes the flame as the same one in his nightmare, the one that destroyed Dragon City, the one that came from amidst the destruction and went straight into Mankeo. It's either the influx of power or the realization of horror but either way, our boy floats amidst himself. His console pops up with another message. This one is to congratulate him for becoming the fire relayer of his civilization, and somehow, it hopes that our boy will pass on the fires of civilization. It blesses him with an initial 10,000 contribution points and showcases that Mankeo has internal injuries alongside him being without any basic skills. It asks if he would like a distribution of his points to make him the best version of himself. Of course, our boy goes for that option immediately, all while maintaining the dragon hibernation stance. He reminisces on how the doctors could not do anything about the internal injuries he had incurred after botching his cultivation last year. Luckily, they're now healed. He can tell because his torn muscles and tendons have all been connected together. The effectiveness basically intoxicates Mankeo, and he doesn't want the healing to stop. The intoxication continues as the console indicates a 35 contribution point expense, in exchange for the Reckless Bull Technique, a technique that has been upgraded to the specialist level and can execute great power. Our boy even gets his memories from his past life back, and realizing that he was powerful there too, sends him wiggling with joy. It all abruptly stops and so does Mankeo's joy when he notices. He seems worried and yells for the fire not to stop. He even claims that he still has contribution points. If he felt sad before, it basically doubles as the console hits him with a warning that all he has left are three points that he cannot exchange for anything. Mankeo is downcast as he wonders how his contribution points got used up so quickly. Our boy isn't going through the stages of grief but he skips all the way to bargaining and tries begging the fire to push him to master level. He even promises to give it an Ayu, but the fire refuses, claiming that the flames of civilization must burn endlessly. It goes on to explain how the civilization's strength is tied to that of the fire relayer, and urges Mankeo to hurry up and contribute to society so he can unlock more skills and missions. Confused, our boy ponders on a way to earn contribution points. The bell dings, indicating the end of the class. Mr. Yen then dismisses all his students but the three dorks will not leave without saying something. All their predictions about him were wrong and dork number one confesses that Mankeo is coming back to the number one spot in the class. Dork number two thinks that the pose, when done well, is quite good for vitality, while the third dork is still surprised that our boy managed to hold out until the end of class. While all the rowdiness is going on, Mankeo laments that he is hungry. The whole place gets so blurry and our boy feels like his stomach is going to melt. He's left thinking whether fire consumes his energy or fix his body and awaken new skills. Worse off, he wonders if he'll have to replenish it himself. Just then, he sees a huge shadow jumping towards him in a scary embrace. It's actually his best friend, Chu Feixing, and he comes bearing smiles. He grabs both of Mankeo's lifeless arms, blaming him for practicing the hibernation stance behind his back and getting so good at it. Our boy leans on his friend and tells him that he forgot to bring some money that day. He then pleads with him to buy him some food from the tuck shop with a promise to repay the gesture for two days in a row. His big-bodied best friend doesn't believe him and swipes our boy's hand away. He thinks Mankeo is never this generous so this must be some sort of trick. Our boy shoots Chu Feixing a smirky smirk and tries charming him with talk of them being half-brothers and always telling him the truth. Because of this, Chu Feixing blushes the red of strawberries in season and grips our boy by the neck. He quips that Mankeo wouldn't deny it even if the whole class heard him and then takes him to the tuck shop. 
Newsflash, Chu regrets this decision soon enough. This is because our boy ransacks the tuck shop with an unholy hunger, leaving a pile of empty ramen packets as proof of the massacre. Chu Feixing tells him to be a man and stop eating up two weeks of his living expenses like an animal. He huffs and puffs but his friend cares not. Chu then resolves to fight him and at that moment, the fire in Meng Kao's eyes awakens. He slaps his big friend away with the back of his hand, telling him not to make a scene. Unfortunately, such a little tap sends Chu Feixing flying outside the shop until he hits a tree. The big boy shamelessly bursts into tears, refusing to believe what had just happened. He quips that he doesn't blame Meng Kao and returns to class without him. As our boy is making his way back, he sees an empty bottle on the floor alongside some other trash, and the person cleaning had mistakenly spilled them. Meng Kao offers to help the lady and picks up the bottle before throwing it into the bin. As soon as he does this, the fire console pops up again, telling him that he has protected the environment and promoted Dragon City's sustained development. It then increases his contribution points by 0.001. He scoffs as he realizes that it could be that simple. Upon reaching the hallway, Chu Feixing pops out from the stairs to hurry our boy up for class. As he's running, so are two other beautiful girls in skimpy skirts. Meng Kao gets distracted and Chu Feixing catches him staring. He knocks our boy on the head before asking him why he would do such a thing. With unwavering conviction, our boy tells his friend that he wouldn't understand. He goes a step further and claims that he, himself, didn't understand until now, but has realized that ordinary life is actually worth risking everything to protect. Xu Feixing expresses his admiration for his friend's ability to be refreshingly shameless, and they both watch the girls run up the stairs. Xu is the first to snap out of it and tells Meng Kao that it's enough. He's more interested in why he killed Mr. Yan in his dream and how Dragon City was destroyed. He then asks our boy about whether or not he became a general and fought until his last moments. Meng Kao gets angry about being called a killer and explains that he just saw scattered scenes here and there. He circles back to Chu's last question and the big boy smiles in expectation. This makes Meng Kao wonder if he should just tell him that he was a frontline fighter or that the monster war was about to escalate with more monsters pouring out. He's so confused that he slaps his hand against his head. Our boy tries to remember if they predetermined the end of destruction without leaving the newbie village. After this, Meng Kao stares at the ground as he remembers his parents. He then faces Chu Feixing, reminding him of the time he wanted to get his undergraduate degree and become a superhuman, but Chu wanted to go to military school and become a general. Wrapping his arm around our boy's shoulder, Chu Feixing reminds him that they talked about it just the day before. Meng Kao quips that it doesn't matter and that what matters is that they make their dreams come through. At this point Chu promises to help his friend with his undergraduate degree in these last 50 days, before putting his fist forward for a fist bump. Meng Kao meets him halfway as they bump fists in agreement. In his heart, our boy just wants to help Chu Feixing too, because he died too miserably in his last life. They both raise their fist emphatically, declaring the goals they hope to achieve in the near future. All the kids in class 6 gather for the long-awaited language class. They may not be enthusiastic about other classes, but for some reason, this is different. One of the students plans to memorize two different poems amidst tears, and another expresses how quickly she ran down. Meng Kao just sits behind them with both hands on his head and an indifferent look on his face. Others just chorus from the background that they miss teacher Wong. The bell indicating the start of the class rings, and all the students sit in expectation. The class doors slide open, letting comments about teacher Wong finally arriving, leaking from the crowd. They all get utterly disappointed as Zhuo Heoren steps into the class instead. He adjusts his glasses before telling them that teacher Wong will not be coming. The class rep then makes all of them follow him to the cultivation room for self-study. Some students break into protest as they request that Teacher Huang be returned to them. The others lament that he's missing the period for the same excuse again. Zuo Heorin just crosses his hands, watching them, and after some time, they troop behind him as they make their way to the cultivation room. Chu Feixing breaks into talk of children their age on planet Earth getting over 20 language lessons every week. He then laments about how he wished they had more language lesson days, days like that would be filled with happiness. For our boy, these would be days where he could read some poems and books rather than partake in only cultivation lessons. The class rep overhears their chit-chat and turns to see what the problem is. He notices that all the other kids are quiet except Meng Kao and his buddy. He yells at them to be quiet in the hallway, and Chu squeezes his face. He whispers how much he hates Suo Heoren's behavior before drawing even closer to gossip the right way. With a hand across his mouth, Fake Sung asks his friend if he would like to know why the class rep did not go for the rocket class but chose to stay and be the representative in normal class. Our boy says he would like to know, and his chubby buddy explains that Heorin just wanted to get the cultivation resources that schools hand out to class representatives. Although his family owns a big company, Feixing still thinks that the rep is shameless for trying to steal resources from the poor students. Our boy murmurs to himself that Feixing would have been the class rep had Zuo Heorin not used his uncle's connection to join the normal class. Said class rep looks at them from the side of his eye, turns around, and screams that the people at the back should stop chit-chatting. 
he reiterates that they shouldn't waste everyone's time. The energy Zuo Heorin puts up is so hostile that it freaks out Feixing. Fear quickly turns into rage as our chubby friend declares that he must teach the class rep a lesson. Amidst the flames, Menkeo serves as the calming and tells his friend to bear with the situation. He advises him to go cultivate first. Both of them stare down the rep's back with so much detestation that Feixing's head almost bursts from it. All this while, Zuo Heorin smiles knowingly to himself. All the students finally arrive at the cultivation center in an orderly manner to see that it's empty. The class rep begins with a speech about the lesson being self-study as they stand amidst state-of-the-art bodybuilding equipment. He explains that all the students are to pick their cultivation module and begin cultivating. Just as Menkeo and his buddy pass by, the rep yells for them not to slack. Our hero chooses to practice with a multifaceted punching pad. He promises to work hard and cultivate from now on. With all this motivation, he gathers momentum and punches one of the pads, quite laughably, I might add. Our hero just blames it on him being too hungry. He then refers to the fire within him as tinder and also extends it some blame, just for consuming his energy as it helps heal his wounds. Our sweet boy falls face first against one of the pads and while taking a vacation from any real work, he wonders why the tinder never provides his body with strength but always claims to help his body recover. He then likens himself to a large tank without fuel that needs large resources to fill up. Dorks number one and two look with pity upon our boy as they reminisce on his previous chance to become a super being. The class rep on the other hand is already drenched in sweat. He yells our hero's name, telling him to leave the set for more serious students if he's not cultivating. Feixing shows up to help an emaciated man KO off the set, telling him that he's having difficulties because he slacked off for a long time and that he just needs to recover slowly. Our hero finds a place to sit beside the weights. From there, he tells his friend that he's fine. As Feixing demonstrates the reckless bull technique on a punching bag, he asks our hero if he has forgotten the foundation of the technique. Menkeo is too exhausted to give an answer so he stares up weakly. This doesn't disturb his best friend who asks if our boy is picking up on his training or if he thinks it's bad. Our hero strains his reply as he quips that Feixing cannot unleash his power this way. In turn, this statement irks his buddy, making him frown and stick his pinky into his ear like he doesn't want to hear what Menkeo has to say. He says he thought they were best buds and wonders why our boy would flex on him. In response to this, our hero claims that Feixing is misunderstanding him and ironically, repeats that his unleashing power is just trash. His chubby friend fake vomits when he hears the word trash. He has to tell our boy that he thinks he is extremely shameless that afternoon. Just then, our hero gets a light bulb moment. He invites his best bud to escort him to the toilet. The plain blue toilet entrance stares at the training students, well, plainly. Both boys stealthily sneak into it, leaving just their heads outside as they observe to ensure that they don't get followed. After this, they shut the door closed only for Feixing to ask our hero what he's trying to do. Menkeo wears a look that is nothing short of sinister as he tells his chubby friend to quickly take off his shirt so he can research his muscles. It's him against his friend in a bathroom stall. It's him up against the bathroom wall. It's a weirded out fake song who asks our boy not to try fighting him, because he would knock our hero's lights out if he did. Menkeo isn't in a fighting mood but he asks his buddy whether he feels like his strength is about to spill anytime he circulates the reckless bull force under his ribs. The realization leaves Feixing wide-eyed and our boy goes on to inspect his friend's leg. He points to a particular spot behind his knee and inquires whether he felt any pain running from the sole of his feet to behind his knees when he stepped on the floor. Our chubby friend is even more shocked as he wonders aloud how the hero knew about it. With dead eyes, the hero tells his friend that he hasn't grasped the meaning of reckless bull force at all. He reminds him that half of his power is just roaming around and that if he continues like this, he may end up having osteoporosis. Like that one lady in church, Feixing bursts into uncontrollable tears and begins to thank our boy for saving him while simultaneously gripping his leg. Menkeo now has a different resolve about his friend and dares him to now show him the kind of force he can unleash. Our chubby friend yells enthusiastically, confessing to his best bud that he feels like his punching power has increased by at least 3%. He's so pumped but our hero, who urges him to go try out his improved technique, is still too tired to take on a pregnant penguin in spring. Right on cue, a fire symbol pops up above Menkeo's head and he calls it a fire spark. It was accompanied by a message about our boy giving a citizen advice that would improve his understanding of a basic skill. He gets blessed with 10 contribution points because of this. His mouth opens alongside his eyes as realization dawns on him. Our boy realizes that all he has to do is teach the current dragon citizens the martial arts from the future and he will be considered to have contributed to society. He goes on a thinking spree as he dissects the meaning of the situation. Our hero concludes that if he can get the current civilization to be stronger, then they will be a hundred times stronger than in his nightmare and be able to utterly defeat the extraordinary beings from the other world. His sinister nature returns as he concludes that he'll get stronger if he gets the population stronger. Thanks to the magic of contribution points, Tinder proceeds to show our hero a list of three things he can choose from as his reward for contributing to civilization. It's either he upgrades his reckless bull force worth 756 contribution points, awakens his gun skill, or awakens his ripple force. 
both are worth 31 and 15 contribution points respectively. Nankeo peruses his options, comparing the pros and cons until he finally chooses to awaken his basic gun skill. You would be disappointed by his logic but here it is anyway. So, the savior of Dragon City had chosen the gun skill because it was the most expensive option that he didn't need to pay for. After this, he leaves his index finger in the air, licks his lips, and promises to get Feiching into military school. His smile is so horrible that our chubby friend loses track of the true purpose of their conversation. Both boys head outside the restroom and stop in front of the punching strength machine. Feiching is really curious to know where his friend learned the weird technique he had used previously, but trust our boy to dismiss the issue. He then convinces his best friend to test his maximum punching strength first. Chu Feiching shoots him a smile and then calms himself by breathing out. All of a sudden, he wears a serious expression as a blue essence leaks from his body. He takes a punching pose but before he can go further, Mr. Killjoy, also known as Zuo Heorin, yells. He asks who permitted them to touch the punching power gauge. Mr. Killjoy adjusts his glasses as he connects the timeline between the two friends leaving for 20 minutes and returning to use the punching machine. All in all, he's more interested in who permitted them to do any of these things. Feiching has had enough. He balls his fist and yells at Zuo Heorin, asking him if he thinks he's a teacher now. He explains that he has just gotten an epiphany on the reckless bull technique, something that Mr. Yan would have no problem with. This makes our chubby friend ask why the class rep keeps butting into his business. With a smirk on his face, Mr. Killjoy tries to talk down on our chubby friend, telling him that his stance is crooked and completely off from the standard reckless bolt force. He mocks Feiching's epiphany and suggests that he steps aside to truly understand the technique if he wants to use the machine. This infuriates Fat Bear, as Menkeo would call him. He gets so mad that he begins to stomp in the class rep's direction. He angrily requests that Zuo Heorin show them how it's done since he claims there's something wrong with our chubby friend's technique. Thanks to our boy blocking his path, Fat Bear doesn't unleash his rage on the class rep. Mr. Killjoy doesn't lose the smirk as he takes off his wristwatch and approaches the machine. He tells Feiching to watch how it's done and proceeds to pack a punch so heavy it moves the base of the machine. It takes a few seconds to collate the results and finally displays 225 kilograms. His fan club just so happens to be present when he performs this feat so they begin spreading the word that the class rep has set a new long-time record with just a casual shot. Another girl sings his praises for improving really quickly in the last two months and declares that he'll get into any college he wants. The last member of the fan club takes a direct shot at Feixing, as she claims that Zuo Heorin's shot surpasses his by 5 kilos, even though our chubby friend is bigger than him. With the very same smirk on his face, the class rep asks if both boys saw his example clearly. Fat Bear is so mad that he doesn't listen to his classmate telling him to test the machine some other time. The same person begs our boy to convince his friend. Instead, Menkeo glances at this classmate and then taps his best friend's back, giving him the go-ahead. A very pissed Feiching approaches the machine but the class rep puts a hand over it, telling him to go back and test it with others before class. It was like pouring water on a duck's back because all Feiching says is for Zuo Heorin to move aside which he doesn't. The obviously smaller boy keeps telling our chubby friend to go back and our hero looks with disdain at a classmate who had given up on Feiching before anything had even happened. Like a literal bear, our chubby friend moves the class rep away with a swipe of his paw, leaving the killjoy to wonder when he had gotten so strong. He's left to watch from the ground as Feiching gathers his momentum. This time, it's a red essence that accompanies him, an essence so strong that it sends shivers down Zuo Heorin's spine. Immediately the punch hits the machine, it has no choice but to lift into the air. The machine doesn't only lift into the air, it pushes back to give room for Feiching's awesomeness. It keeps collating the score until it settles at 785 kilograms. The very same classmate who had discouraged him is the first to point out that he overtook Zuo Heorin's record. Fat Bear wasn't expecting such great results and is confused about the outcome. He looks left and right in search of answers but they didn't come. Instead, Menkeo does a bit that Feiching had done to him blaming him for cultivating such a strong super reckless bull behind his back. With his finger pointed, our boy makes sure to state that his best friend knocked the rep's record out of the park. As Heorin's fan club overhears this, they pretend like they didn't. Our hero breaks into a dialogue with himself, talking out loud about the absence of a teacher for the super reckless bull technique and how it would give him a few more extra points in the exams if he can increase a few kilograms. The girls who were watching him get all weirded out but it doesn't concern our boy. He breaks into the joyful tears technique and asks Feiching to be his teacher. His best friend doesn't believe it but is mostly confused because Meng Keo was the one who taught him the technique in the bathroom just now. With his arms now folded, our hero quips that he knows his friend's time is precious before the exams and promises to use cultivation resources to pay to learn the technique from him so he doesn't make any losses. This small speech hit home for Feiching. He already agreed to act with our boy but said boy's already crying and begging his best butt again. As though they have a hive mind, all the other students begin to crowd the new record holder, pleading with him to help them improve too. All this while he's still trying to literally shake off our hero from his hand. 
Menkeo cannot see an opportunity and let it go. He proposes that since teaching one person is basically the same as teaching more people, Feixing should make a super reckless bowl learning squad and everyone would take out cultivation resources to pay him. With that beautiful sinister smile, he also quips that his best friend could spread his influence through this medium. All the other students standing behind our hero shamelessly scream their interest in the idea. Meanwhile, Zuo Heoran is still on the floor where Feixing had left him, biting his teeth in regret. Tinder pops up again. This time, it's to compliment our boy for pulling the class together with his suggestions. It tells him that he has increased our urge to learn and in turn, their chances to contribute to civilization in the future. For all of this, he gets an extra 11 contribution points. He brings back the smirk after this and begins to scream that Feixing is so kind, unselfish and had even gotten chosen as the class rep by the previous teacher. Everyone turns to look at Zuo Heoran with disdain. Our funny friend just stares blankly at the situation. The class rep, on the other hand, mutters our hero's name beneath his breath only to get a hand stretched towards him. On the outside, Menkeo apologizes to the rep for what he said telling him that they were just random words that came out of his mouth. On the inside, our boy basically takes an oath to discuss Zuo Heoran in every way until his death. The rep misses our hero's hand, standing to his feet on his own. He then tells him that he's not angry and that is the class rep. He must do contributions to everyone. It turns out everyone has things they say and the ones they keep in their hearts because Zuo Heoran smiles on the outside but also swears to make sure our boy doesn't get into any university. As the sun sets that beautiful day, Feixing and his best bud meet atop the school building. He hands our boy a host of supplements, telling him that he slacked off for a year so he needs them more than him. Our boy refuses to take them all and proposes that they split them 7 to minus 30, no take backs. Our chubby friend doesn't have a problem with this, what's really bothering him is how Menkeo got access to the technique he had taught. Our hero cannot look his friend in the eye, only because he's about to lie his ass off. He tells him that he got the technique from a private underground life force forum. He then claims that he specifically distinguished the super reckless bull himself so there's no problem with it. In his heart, our boy is sorry that he cannot open up to his friend about Tinder. Instead, he feeds him a fail-safe for his lie, and advises Feixing to tell the students that the technique is a testing version and that it might have a bug. Menkeo had thought of adding contributions to the idea but advises his friend not to force them to learn if they don't want to. Fat Bear runs towards the stairwell and screams from the entrance that he will tell the students exactly what our boy suggested. He says he'll leave first and advises our hero to also leave soon. After his friend leaves, Menkeo and his bag of supplements turn around. As a wave of nostalgia hits him, he quips that he hates the mist. He then approaches the edge of the roof and stands atop it. In his head, he relives how the mist sealed up Dragon City and stopped humans from going around killing monsters. The youngster happens to also hate the city because of how dense and crowded the buildings and streets are. He finds that it makes cultivation way too stressful. Mankeo may be the chosen one but he's just like every other youngster. He secretly read books and watched movies about Earth. He remembers watching students get only two lessons on physical education but get countless language and math lessons. Adults, on the other hand, had to work just eight hours a day there and could earn large salaries, build large houses, and even eat luxurious food. Our boy's eyes go wet with tears as they roll down his cheek. He realizes again that Earth is a place they can no longer return to and his nightmare is just a hellish dream that will eventually come to pass. He quips that he is staring at their only home. His thoughts get interrupted by Tinder informing him that Reckless Bull is being spread throughout the citizens, thereby increasing Dragon City's overall power. Just as our hero expected, he gains points even if it's just people spreading the technique. On that note, he gets more and more notifications of extra credit points being added to him. He smiles as he admits how good it feels to do contributions. Menkeo's thoughts are interrupted yet again, this time, it's by a public announcement. He abruptly stares at the spaceship as it doles out warnings about the city's weather department's latest news. In essence, they warn of monsters entering the urban area because of the mist, the north side's factory area to be precise. This ginormous ship continues to give out instructions about the locations that different ranks will be covering, and finally advises everyone to follow the rules, be on alert and prepare to parry any attacks. Our boy is even more mortified as the ship claims that they're all Earth's expedition army and spreads false hope that they will rejoin Earth after the victory. Like daybreak, it dawns on Menkeo afresh that monsters will be attacking that night. Our hero pushes everyone aside as he rushes to meet the bus. Sweating and on edge, he yells for the bus to wait. Unfortunately, it's already on the move by the time he gets there. This, like many other things, doesn't deter him. He chases after the bus amidst the massive exhaust fumes, coughing and yelling for them to let him get on it. Zuo Heoran catches a glimpse of our boy and smirks as he calls him a peasant. Well that pleasant eventually gets on the bus, although he's more drenched in sweat than a fat man in a sauna. When the driver announces their arrival at the Hulin area station, it's another struggle for our hero to get out. He heaves a sigh of relief that he has finally gotten home. Our hero steps into quite the busy street, bustling with people of all ages selling all types of things. It's basically a rundown market but it brings back warm memories whenever Mankeo returns to it. 
He smiles as he overhears an older lady give a sand snail vendor hell for selling what will still bite people. To him, the noisy market is a symphony and it's filled with the energy that infuses him with joy. Just then, he overhears someone calling him brother. He turns and she asks him to help her carry a heavy bucket of fish. He calls her Giacao, accompanied with a smile of familiarity. This gets taken away by the hot flashes that rush into his mind. Mankeo grabs hold of his head as the image of a slender purple hand approaches him. He remembers the nightmare he had, and how his own sister had become the villain. In our hero's trance, he remembers that no matter where his sister goes, all she ever brings is the endless darkness night. She was known as the Black Darkness Witch and never hesitated to step on Mankeo any chance she got. As our boy remembers how she stared down at him one time, the real Zio calls out his name, trying to get him to snap out of it. Only when he slowly regains himself does he see her waving too close to his face. Zio is curious to know why her brother is acting like a rat that had just seen a cat. The analogy hits too close to home as our hero sweats profusely, thinking to himself that he never knew his little sister could be like such a villainous. Abruptly clasping Zio's shoulders, he asks her if she would step on him if she obtains powers. She shoots him a shy smile before declaring that she wouldn't do such a thing to her dear brother. Her heart has a different opinion. She admits only to herself that stepping on him would be the first thing she does and that she would not stop stepping. Our boy thinks there must be a reason why his sister is the Black Darkness Witch. He wonders what the reason could be and asks her if she is satisfied with or mad at him. Zio's eyes glitter with innocence as she returns the question, asking how he expects her to be mad. She does one better and inquires why she would be mad. On the inside, her inner demons are winning. She calls Mankeo a bad brother, claiming that she is obviously unsatisfied with him. Our unknowing hero proudly pats his sister till she gets red with embarrassment. Zio then asks if she provoked him. Maybe that could be the reason he bullies her so much. It's not. Our boy picks up the bucket of meat and with a smile on his face, asks if a brother needs a reason to bully his younger sister. As Zio throws a tantrum behind him, our boy admits to himself that he will bully his sister while he can still defeat her, seeing as she will become the black darkness witch who steps on him. With fresh conviction, our hero thrusts one foot in front of the other, telling himself that he will never let his sister become the scary witch. He promises to make her the most happy and pretty princess that everyone loves. They break into sibling banter as Zio tells her brother that she hates him. Smirking, he replies that it makes him like her more, he taunts her as he claims that she cannot kill him, promises to punish him by making him put down armor rhino's meat and telling her dad about it. As they thread the busy street, Mankeo tells his sister that he knows she cares for him but he will carry the meat anyway. Infuriated for some reason, she tries to deny it and calls our boy a bad guy. They finally get to apartment 704, also known as home, and the first thing she does is report our hero to his mother. Obviously, if there's anyone who can teach him a lesson, it's this woman. He yells above his sister's bantering to announce his arrival. Luckily, their mother had made a fresh hot batch of spring rolls. She calls out Zio for always complaining about her brother and then invites both of them to come eat the spring rolls while they are still hot. All the while, she is smiling and balancing herself with one of her crutches. Our boy's eyes open up like he can actually see John Cena. The sight of the spring rolls are nothing short of heavenly and our hero reaches out to take one. Mankeo takes just one bite and tears flow down the edges of his face. The taste got him in his feelings. His mother is weirded out in an adorable way but is pushed to ask her son if one bite is enough for the tears. His stupid sister tells her that our hero's brain is spoiled and makes a silly face at him. The rattling open of the gate announces their father. He calls Zio disrespectful and tells her that he heard her voice from outside. He then instructs her to check the TV for any live battle going on. With food sticking out of her mouth, she hurriedly switches the TV on. They are welcomed with news of the military's battle crab team completing the North City's arrangement by 8.50 that night. These crabs that they speak of are actually crab-shaped. Dragon City-owned, advanced battle machines strictly made of metal to run on rare jewels. Humans seem to be pretty confident that otherworldly monsters will lose to the crab machine, and Sayo stays engrossed as the newscaster introduces the viewers to a certain Gen Dong. The caster calls him a biologist of Dragon City University and gives him the floor to make a statement. Mr. Gen explains that Dragon City has had three missed attacks and that its main forces are armor monsters. This triggers our hero's sister to announce that her teacher had taught her that the armor type was the weakest. She then switches the channel out of disinterest. On the screen now is Dragon City's one and only Yihao, a ninja man jumping from the top of a building. Our girl's eyes brighten with excitement as her mom quips that she is now a big girl, and her father declares that she is obsessed with the Luo Wu martial artist. Meanwhile, she is just thinking of how she would love to live in a 200-meter one-room house. All of a sudden the TV goes off and the room seems to shake. Our hero quickly tells his sister to be careful amidst the ruckus seeing as the monster has arrived in their district. Speakers begin to blare warnings that the solidarity mode will be activating in the small area of Tian Fuyuan. It adds that all the power will be directed into the defense functions. This announcement causes quite a ruckus. People begin to climb the walls of their building so that family and friends will help them inside via their windows. 
the alarms continue to blare for solidarity mode activation until a tall metal wall, padded with unbelievable weaponry rises to enclose the city of Tian Fuyuan. The wall initiates another warning when a monster finally invades. This terrible beast looks like a mix between a ladybug and a carnivorous worm, but way bigger and more ferocious. They tag it a bug-type invasion as multiple beasts fitting the description begin to fill the town. It gets so loud that you would have to close your ears, the shooting from the solidarity wall, I mean. One of the defenders operates a pod on the wall, strapped with two machine guns and releasing multiple bullets into a horde of bug monsters. Word then comes through for all the land bunkers to be raised. This time, all the lower will be prioritized to the hunger and high-pressure tower. This high-pressure tower emanates from within the ground, gathers up energy, and releases an attack so potent that tens of monster bugs are sent flying in different directions. Anxiously, Menkeo keeps track of the situation with his binoculars. He first exclaims that the monster bugs are so many, before thinking about how long he will last on just the nutrient he drank before the battle began. His father barges into the room for a progress report and our hero informs him that the high-pressure tower worked. Up next is his grandma, who tells our boy and his father to be on the lookout while she and her dog Daya will look after his mother. Sayo is confused as the dog runs from side to side like there's no crisis right outside. Our hero turns to plead with his grandma to be careful but gets pulled by his ear in return. She shouts into his ear, asking if he thinks she is a burden because her arms and legs are weak. The savior of Dragon City squeals and begs his grandmother to spare him. He agrees that she is right and would be perfectly fine without help. Both of them stop their playing when the gunshots stop. They even noticed that one of the monsters had taken down the high-pressure tower. After making a mess of the tower, this same monster releases a purplish essence that accompanies its wings as they open. The same thing occurs for almost all the bug monsters present and they take to the air together. Through their peephole, our hero's father notices the bugs are the mutated flame's black armor bugs also known as the flying flame bug. Panic falls upon him and he rushes down to ready himself and our boy, telling him that they'll attack the bugs when they come closer. He quips that the knight will be a tough one as he hands Meng Kao a gun and takes one for himself. True to his words, our hero's father stands by his window firing bullets upon bullets at these flying bugs. He finds them really annoying because hitting them is a 50 minus 50 thing no matter how much bullets he sprays. As our boy balances to use his weapon, he thinks to himself that a lot of people will die if the knight continues like this. Just then, Tinder pops up, surprising our boy just enough to throw him off balance. Tinder asks if our hero is ready to activate the first combat mission of mutated bug hunting. It's not the people he will save, more like the 15 0 credit points he will receive after he completes the mission that pushes him. Tinder also offers him the chance to upgrade any foundational skill by one level should he win. Our boy immediately activates it and his gold-rimmed pupils light up with raw excitement. First off, he activates his basic shooting skill. It takes some time warming up so his grandmother thinks that he is hesitating. She approaches him and puts a hand on his shoulder. The older woman then asks our boy if he is too scared to shoot, offering to do it if he cannot. Well, he can. Benkeo releases about three bullets back to back, all executed with an unholy accuracy that punctures holes in all his intended victims. Tinder updates our hero's stats after he heavily damages a flying flame bug by adding 1.1 credits and increasing gun proficiency to 25%. His grandma has no choice but to compliment our boy's aim, slapping him fondly and telling him that his three shots were just as good as his grandpa's when he was alive. Our boy just smiles awkwardly as he wonders out loud if she is his real grandmother. He smirks and blames his grandmother's disruption for not directly killing the monster with his continuous three shots. He wields the gun yet again, taking a knee as he concentrates fully this time. Then Kao shoots down the next monster that comes his way and Tinder congratulates him for his first kill. They end up increasing his proficiency until it gets to 58%. All because our boy didn't stop at one monster, he continued to shoot down as many as he could. When he takes a break, he admits to himself that his skills from his former life are gradually coming back. Even his father admits that our boy's shooting skills are much better than his. He explains that he had to learn to shoot after getting injured during his cultivation the year before. Our hero gets some encouragement as his father places a hand on his shoulder and quips that it must have been hard for Meng Kao. Immediately after their heartwarming moment, both men lift their guns again, with an unfaltering conviction. The father tells the son to continue with the momentum and perform well that night. The son tells the father that he will, wielding the second most dangerous weapon, his smile. They open fire on the asses of these monster bugs, taking them out one after the other. In the heat of it, our hero's father tells him to take care of his body, but our hero quickly dismisses the sentiment, informing his dad that he is fine. Something slips into Mankeo's consciousness, the realization that there is a scarier and more mysterious monster that hasn't appeared yet. His eyebrows furrow as confusion mixes with what was once conviction. Our boy then resolves to find the monster. He looks through the scope of his gun and unfortunately, a much more majestic flying flame bug comes into view. This bug happens to be much bigger than the rest, with some gold-colored wings and a ferociousness that shouldn't be trifled with. 
removing his eyes from the scope. He fearfully declares that the monster is already there. Chapter 9 Thanks to the mysterious bug monster, the building had been destroyed, with bloodied corpses laying all over the ruined architecture. This is the way things turned out in Mankeo's nightmare and this is what he is scared will repeat itself. The monster had cut buildings in half and our boy's mind wanders towards the villain his sister will become and back to the monster at hand. He tries shooting it down but soon realizes how pointless it is. He admits that his shooting rank is much too low to even dent it, and that if he wanted to deal any damage, he would have to either be a master rank or a perfect rank. Flames literally escort this monster into the sky alongside the lesser monster bugs. They all buzz into the sky and attack military forces together. One of the soldiers quip that the bugs are weird and his colleague warns him about the same one our boy is scared of. They open fire from behind set barricades. One of them yells that the flaming bugs shouldn't be let into the residential area. As the soldiers are shooting theirs, so is our boy. He plans to stop the monster at all cost and is rapidly increasing his proficiency. It stands at 65% at the moment but our hero realizes that he still has to upgrade before the monster awakens. When the golden part of its wings open up, the monster bug seems to have dead red eyes on them. One of the soldiers concludes that it is a super beast and immediately reports that the Tan Fu area has discovered an unknown super beast. The soldier requests for the support of some super beings but the line seems to be breaking up. He angrily slams the barricade, blaming the crisis for the break in transmission. Bullets are still flying from Menkeo's gun when his father tells him to pick his sister, mother and the others and make a run for it. He screams that there may be a super monster. Meanwhile, our hero doesn't stop shooting. Instead, he tells his father to take everyone and leave him. His father doesn't like this one bit but our boy explains that he knows what the monster is. Right on cue, the monster gathers its first fireball and unleashes it upon screaming humans. It causes a massive coat of black smoke to conceal the beast, making an already difficult mission even more difficult for the soldiers. They lament that they cannot see the beast but they fire aimlessly into the black smoke anyway. The bugs fly higher into the air only so they can shoot themselves down like meteors into the residential area. One of them bursts through the wall of one of the buildings and a father tries protecting his daughter from it. It would have been a futile mission had the assassination squad not hit at that moment. The assassin pierces the head of the bug clean through with a blade and then calls up the other members of the assassination squad to never let the bugs enter residential areas again. The assassins yell a mantra that declares Earth and Dragon City as victorious. They then dive into the thick of things. On the other hand, our hero takes down another three bug monsters, thanks to the scope on his gun. Tinder pops up dot to congratulate him on finishing the mission and blesses him with his 15-0 credits alongside a chance to upgrade any skill. Holding off on the upgrade, our boy chooses to first use the credit points to make his shooting skill proficiency a 100%. With this, he gets moved up to professional rank and then to perfect rank. Only after these does our boy implement his upgrade, telling Tinder to upgrade his basic shooting skill by one rank. A golden aura encompasses Mankeo as Tinder confirms his first battle reward and congratulates him on being moved up to perfect rank. This blesses our hero with quite the convenient ability. He gets shown that the golden petals of the bug can enhance its body functions and its head armor is full of sense organs. These two come up as the weak points of this super beast and our boy just smiles after taking note of them. To show that he means business, our hero reloads his gun with armor-breaking bullets and tells the super beast to bring it on as he points the gun in its direction. Just then, Zio pops out of nowhere and fires her gun. Unfortunately, the kickback sends her flying. It also distracts Mankeo and draws the attention of the super beast. Our boy stares at his sister on the ground and gets full of regret for not refitting her gun. By the time he returns his gaze, the super beast roars in his direction with eyes red as scarlet. This is our hero's reminder that he has been discovered. Even as others continue to shoot at the monsters, the super beast easily weaves its way through their bullets. A claw makes its way through their small window, almost taking Zio's life. Our boy yells for her to watch out and proceeds to quickly shield his sister with his body. The monster continues to pick at the window, using it as its starting point to tear open Menkeo's apartment. Filled with morbidity, all our hero can do is watch as the huge monster comes face to face with him and his sister. He stares up at it, remembering what had happened in his dream. His austere had pulled out her gun and helped kill the monster. Sadly, the loudness of the gunshot attracted a very terrible demon who injured their mother to the point of hospitalization. A series of bad luck had sprung on the family after that, and our boy thinks it could be the birth of her villain story. A new anger arises in him, having realized that this monster took his homeland of 17 years from him and even hurt his family. He adjusts the gun to face the enemy as he promises not to let his nightmare become a reality. Mankeo fires the first armor-breaking bullet amidst his war cry. It goes with so much force that shatters the armor covering the monster's head and creates a ripple effect big enough to cause a gust of wind. His father yells at him, asking if he has gone insane but our boy just asks for his father's trust. Insanity is just genius and hiding anywhere. The injured monster seeks to avenge itself and struggles to gather another flame ball. A glint of excitement laces Mankeo's eyes as he sees exactly what he has been waiting for. He maximizes this opportunity and sends a perfect level shot spiraling in the direction of the super beast. 
The bullet pierces the same spot the first one did but this time, it takes out all of its sense organs in an explosive impact. Our boy yells for it to die and the beast falls from his apartment window till its corpse splatters on the ground below. Afterwards, two soldiers approach the corpse, one of them confirms that the beast has been killed and the other gives credit to our hero's father, claiming that he knew he was a sharpshooter but didn't expect the man to still be fit as a fiddle at his age. He then relays to the rest of the team that they should kill the remaining bugs. With new motivation, they run in guns blazing. Meanwhile, the savior of Dragon City bleeds from his nose with barely enough strength to admit that he accomplishes his mission. He falls to the ground from fatigue and his father runs to support him, screaming his name to keep him awake. It's a weird time to review the workings of the perfect level shot but it's what Menkeo is doing as he lays in his father's arms. He realizes that the bullet is used to completely trigger the spiritual energy riot in the beast's body, making the beast basically kill itself once the bullet makes impact. As blood stains his nostrils, all he is grateful for is that the nightmares can be shattered and the future can be changed. He is grateful that fate still lies in his hands. Sayo hurries inside with a first aid box, threatening her older brother not to die since she hasn't taken her revenge yet. She quickly switches her statement and claims that he cannot die since she hasn't paid him back yet. Our girl has a streak of tears from her face to her chin as she tries feeding Menkeo some medicine. He then responds weakly, asking her who said he was going to die. She dismisses his statement with a question of her own, smiling and asking if her brother is okay. Immediately she confirms that he will live. She starts touching him all over, wanting to know if anything hurts and whether or not his mind is clear. Our boy just groans in pain and tells his sister to let go of him. She stubbornly continues to check him all over, leaving our boy no choice but to conclude that she is doing it because she is an evil girl. His grandma has both hands behind her back as she asks if he is okay. Our boy says he is fine but laments about being out of strength. He then pleads with his father to take credit for the kill and keep his marksmanship a secret. It's an easy ask for his father. All that matters to the man is that his son is okay. His grandma also promises not to say a word. After this, our hero's dad informs him that the insect swarm has fallen back and encourages Menkeo to have some rest. Although he is weaker than a plush doll, he just lays on the ground, smiling. He takes a look at the ruins, and then his family, only to accept that it's finally over. His mom and dad hold each other as they laugh. The soldiers help their injured colleagues. All in all, our boy thinks he can consider this life to be saved. His bliss is interrupted, and our hero gets wide-eyed with so much morbidity that he sits up wondering why he didn't get a kill message from Tinder yet. Could it be that the super beast is still alive? Drops of blood splatter onto the concrete. It turns out our beloved hero cannot stand down without making sure everyone is safe. His sister and father call out for him but he ignores them both, holding himself as he trudges along. As he bleeds, he blames himself for having a weak body, for having a body that has wounds that are still unhealed, and for having a body without any strong ability. Gritting his teeth, our boy laments about his brain and body needing time to properly sync with each other. He even blames it for his timing and accuracy being off despite having perfect rank consciousness and the monster's weakness at hand. Our hero shivers, staggers, and balls one fist out of anger, holding onto an exposed rod with the other fist. Menkeo begins to wonder if his sister will still end up as the Black Darkness Witch and if fate is like a flowing river rather than something a mere man can change. Unfortunately, none of this matters as our hero watches the super beast he thought he killed get back on its feet. All our boy wants is to change fate by all means and with that determination, he resolves to use Reckless Bull to take down the monster. Amidst his pain and bleeding, he activates the technique, his eyes begin to glow and his body emanates a certain steam. Before he can jump, a burst of energy appears in the sky accompanied by a swift line of lightning fast energy falling from it. It then pierces and electrocutes the super beast to its death. The monster has to be dead this time, but in the middle of all the lightning, a man, a super being more like, balances on top of the sword that pierced the monster with the grace of a ballerina. He's draped in a white overhead cape with a black sash across his neck alongside very well hidden facial features. The soldiers in the environment yell that a super being has arrived and our boy struggles to stare down at him. While he's still seated, Tinder pops up with fresh accolades for our boy's efforts. He gets 1978 credit points for stalling his city's destruction and for playing an important role in the defense battle. It gives him another 500 credit points for decreasing his sister's blackening possibility by 2%, and the icing on the cake is getting his pick of three skills. Our hero could either go with the beginner dragon snake aura or the beginner harvest skill but all he's thinking about is the super being. About an hour passes before the cleanup crew arrives. They're jamming up with some music as they dissect the monsters on the floor. Our boy's father, who's also a harvester, tells his colleague to work faster so that they can eat some race crabs. Unfortunately, the mutated ones are off the table. His colleague doesn't even mind his statement and warns him to be careful when collecting black water. The reason is that it costs a boatload of money. Back to our downtrodden hero who's still sitting by the hole the monster had created in their wall. This time, he can move because he had some food and drank his nutrient liquid. His face shows premium discomfort as he lifts his fingers to massage his tempo. It turns out our boy feels pain in his brain after exchanging so many skills. 
the evolution of these monsters worries our boy, that, and the fact that the incoming war will be chaotic and out of control. With a stern expression, he resolves to get stronger as quickly as possible. He stares at his hand, admitting to himself that his perfect skill is not enough. He realizes that he needs to be able to continuously use the skill in battle so that his brain and body can be equally phenomenal. Sadly, he gets hit by a wave of negativity and begins to lament about always being hungry, not having any cultivation resources, and even getting tired as hell after defeating a black armor bug. This pushes him to tears and makes him rethink how he's going to fight. Having made his way to his room, Zio barges in to complain about the smell of dismantled bugs downstairs. He just steals a glance at her and acknowledges that it's because of the harvesters. He then returns to reminiscing about how his mother got injured by the super beast in his other life and how he failed his exam because of it. To earn enough money to cover his mom's medical fees, his father had brought him into the harvesting business and they got so good at dismantling these beasts. Our boy's eyes shine a different type of gold as he remembers how much more money harvesters make. He immediately pulls up tender and heads straight for the exchange list. With a total of 2478 credits, Menkeo has a chance to pick amongst the ripple skill, beginner harvest skill, and the snake aura skill. A maniacal smile comes to his lips as he discovers the beginner harvest skill to be the cheapest of all three at 998 credits. He attributes it to God helping him out and decides to try out the skill since awakening and upgrading other skills is already a normal thing for him. With a finger pointed to the sky, our boy yells at Tinder to exchange the beginner harvest skill. At that moment, Menkeo appears to be consumed by a golden flame, with eyes brighter than headlamps in the dark. One would expect him to stop there but he doesn't. Our hero instructs Tinder to upgrade his beginner harvest skill to profession rank. This time it feels like our boy is falling into a pool of knowledge, soaking in all things agriculture and animal anatomy. He realizes that the profession rank beginner skill has some sort of combo with the perfect rank basic shooting skill. This reinforces the fact that he made a good choice. The only problem now is that our hero is the only one with knowledge of evolved monsters in the whole of Dragon City. This is enough to make him feel kind of important. He doesn't know when he breaks into a small laugh, rubbing his palms against each other. Just then, Zio peeps from his door, thinking that his wretched smile must mean that her brother is up to something evil again. At the crack of dawn, our boy's father packs his bags. He's on his way out when both his children ambush him by the doorway. Mankeo declares his intent to follow the man to work while Zio just wants to bid her father goodbye. The man is left to explain that he got a call from the battlefield in the north and was told that they're in need of harvesters. No one asks but our boy breaks into an explanation anyway. He tells his father that he may not get the results he's looking for from his national college examinations in his current state. He postulates that it's better for him to become a harvester rather than searching for a random job. Our boy has given his father a lot to think about, and think about it, he does. The man admits that the marksmanship runs in Mankeo's veins, but the boy's body is too weak for him to get into college. He weighs it against harvesting and although it's a dangerous job, it's still a profession with the highest probability of awakening supernatural powers. All things being equal, his dad shoots him a thumbs up and agrees to bring our boy to work. Zio immediately spins to face our hero, grabbing his hand as she tries to confirm if he truly wants to be a harvester. She looks so worried that Mankeo concludes about the love between siblings running deep. He concludes that even the Dark Witch got worried when she heard that her brother wanted to do such a dangerous job. The story changes when Zio turns her gaze away, asking her brother to bring home some tasty monsters especially if he runs into the flaming black beetles again. Our boy throws a tantrum, blaming himself for having such high hopes for his sister. Fast forward to the evening time and the tires of their armored truck squash monster corpses as they draw closer to the site under the banner of resource recovery. Tinder then gives us a short breakdown of the situation. He explains that monsters, although hateful, are the only strategic resource to sustain the development of Dragon City. Apparently, a lot of guns, ammunition, and the precious lives of soldiers will not be reaped if the government continues to indiscriminately bombard and crush all the monsters into slack. If that happens, Dragon City will run out of resources, starve to death, and die of entrapment in three to five years. In all of this, the superhumans are the solution. You see, they can kill off these monsters with cold weapons that leave monster bodies very much intact and reserve many resources along the way. The troop of resource recovery armor trucks arrive at the scene of battle all in a straight file. Our boy stares out the window as he gets an epiphany about superhumans being the key and the army just being an aid against monsters all these years. They draw near a huge purple monster corpse, stained green by God knows what. Then Kao's dad tells him that a soldier's job is much too rough, and neither is harvesting such an easy thing to do. He advises our boy to be bold, careful, and to learn from his father to not be nervous. When our hero tells his dad that he isn't nervous, he gets asked how so. His dad explains that a real battlefield is nothing like the fight they had back home. He describes it as a ground with thousands of monsters, and most of them get piled on top of each other like semi-dirty clothes on your room chair. After telling Menkeo about the scene having a sea of blood, he asks him how he could not be nervous again. The verdict hasn't changed, as Judge Hero reiterates that he seriously isn't afraid. His dad is still skeptical and tells our boy that he doesn't have to be shy with him. 
Tinder pops up again with a very weird fact about the smell of advanced monsters stimulating the central nervous system and getting newcomers to pee their pants. Our hero almost repeats his answer but switches it up at the last minute, telling his father that he may have peed his pants a little. His father is happy that our boy opened up and encourages him with a nudge on the shoulder. He pulls in closer, telling him that he wants to let him in on a secret. Our boy's father reveals that on a harvester's first day on site, he's supposed to put on a diaper. Naivety pushes our hero to ask his father how he expects them to get diapers at such a late hour. Houdini would be jealous of the way Mankeo's father pulls some diapers out of thin air, smiling and presenting them to him. He tells our hero that he should go to a corner and put one on when the truck reaches its final destination promising to keep a lookout for him so he won't get embarrassed. All of a sudden, our boy gets filled with confidence towards his national college examination and doesn't want to be a harvester anymore. He asks for a chance to go home only for his father to declare amidst smiles that it cannot be done. The trucks finally arrive in a place where green vines can be found on every single thing. As they step out, Menkeo's father informs him that Mr. Shen is the leader of the company and also the one who decides the people who become harvesters. He advises his son to be smart and good later on and our boy understands the assignment. Upon reaching Big Brother Shen's office, the man spreads himself on a couch, holding a hand fan. He's the general manager of the Prosperous Resource Recovery Company and calls our boy's father Lao Meng before asking if our hero is his son. Mr. Lao steps forward, bows his head, and tries shaking his boss as he explains his reason for coming. Sadly, Mr. Shen looks at him like a sheep that has come to him. He takes off his breathing mask and inquires about our boy's injuries, stating that he won't be able to explain things to his brother-in-law. Gripping his employer's hands, Mr. Lau explains that his son's injuries were mild but he's fine now. He then promises to help our boy to become a skilled harvester in less than two years. He plays the big brother card and pleads with Mr. Shen to help them as he slips him a golden card. Menkeo quickly notices that the card is from the Golden Dragon Trade Mall and is worth at least $10,000. This makes our boy wonder how his father could afford such a thing. It makes him want to ambush the employer and get the card back. Mr. Chen wraps his hand around our hero's father, agreeing to let him bring on any disciple he wants because his harvesting team is only attached to the company. As they both flash each other fake smiles, the employer gives just one condition and that is to ever cause trouble. He smolders his face as he reiterates that he doesn't mind if they cause him trouble personally. The problem would come only if they get his brother-in-law angry. Mr. Lao is full of fear. He nervously laughs as he promises not to cause either Mr. Shen or Mr. Hu any trouble whatsoever. He taps our boy's shoulder and makes him thank the manager for the job. Our hero does as he's told, with his head bowed even. Mr. Shen swipes them away, telling them to get to work and forget the chit-chat. As their heads stay bowed, our boy thinks about how this Shen fellow can still save so much money. It's obvious to the blind that the company could use many more amenities. Our hero feels like this man could be worse than Zuo Heoran and stares daggers at him as he leaves. His father notices the expression on his face and warns him not to offend the manager. This is so difficult for our hero because he can remember how much this manager person made his father's life miserable in his previous life. He's so mad that he balls his fist just thinking about it. With their masks and gear, father and son head out to get some work done. Amidst the vines and toxicity, Menkeo begins to question his dad about opening his own business seeing as the man has been a harvester for 10 years and everyone sees him as their leader. In turn, Mr. Lau lets his son know that it's not that easy to start your own thing. There's the problem of startup capital and also the lack of necessary contacts to source monster corpses. He places his hand on his son's shoulder, pleading with him to hold on for just two more years till he becomes familiar with the job and Zio enters college. Then and only then will they revisit the issue. The man-man promises not to make his son go through the stress of the job for the rest of his life. Our hero switches the topic as he asks if his father has noticed the increase in the number of monsters. The man is confused and asks what our boy means. Menkeo then makes reference to something his biology teacher said. He informs his father that the monsters will appear before humans only after they're done with their evolution, and they will appear in larger numbers, in a more violent way. He reminds his father of the Super Beast incident and tells him how much of a threat it is. He also calls it a fortunate event for building up their family fortune and urges his father to seize the opportunity. Mr. Lau takes all his son says under advisement. He then tells him that they have to work first. He promises to revisit the matter but right now, he wants to show his son how to harvest monsters. Our boy stays quiet but in his mind, all he wants is not to rely on others. He had come back from a nightmare so taking his fate into his own hands is such a big deal for him. From the entrance of the site, you can see the pulleys lifting mighty monster corpses with mesh nets. Before they start working, our hero's father asks his son if he padded his diapers well but our boy just stays quiet from shame. Mr. Lau lifts the stinger of a yellow-tailed giant scorpion as he informs his son that they harvested only crustaceans that day. The other harvester hounds our hero, out of excitement or maybe a need to show their experience. Anyway, Menkeo isn't really moved by it. One of them wants to know if he has ever seen so many monsters and even asks if our boy finds it interesting. Harvester number two wants our hero to touch some monster corpses, promising that they'll never get hurt. 
Lastly, Harvester number 3 is having a blast as he wields a pincer that's still moving. The poor boy blandly thanks all his uncles for their concern. His father comes to his rescue as he introduces his son to his test soon X for the day. He promises to harvest the yellow-tailed scorpion slowly so his boy can carefully understand. He starts with the two front limbs, cracking them open with two crowbars going in opposite directions. Cracking them open reveals quite the lump of meat and concludes lesson one. His father moves on to cutting open the abdominal area with a specialized sickle as he explains how the shell can be reused directly as armor or be made into an alloy. Some sticky liquid leaks out of the opened area. His father informs him that it could be used as farm fertilizer or to grow gigantified earthworms. As for lesson 3, it's poisonous, it's vulgar, and it's scorpion venom that can be turned into medicine for activating the superpower in the depth of anyone's genes. As he says this, he uses a smaller sickle to scrape the poison from the stinger into a beaker. He then breaks into talk of poison needles and how they're hard. This feature makes them the best sniper bullets since they also come with natural corrosion and virulent effects. Our boy gets a kit handed to him as his father encourages him to not be afraid. He tells his son that the experiment isn't too valuable and that any mistakes he makes can be rectified. Menkeo accepts it as he promises to try. He begins with a hand-sized chainsaw in one hand and a crowbar in the other. There's an air of mastery about him as he tears open the scorpion. The first thing he does is to extract the perfectly separated central nervous cord and place it in a nerve cell solution to keep it fresh. He locks the jar and proceeds to use a butterfly scalpel to peel off the flesh and carapace of the scorpion. In no time, Menkeo wields a specialized vacuum, using the container to store the scorpion meat intact. He then uses a machine to hold up the stinger as he extracts the valuable mucus into a vacuum aspirator. By the time our faux surgeon is done, the insides of the scorpion are left empty and neat. He wipes some sweat with his scalpel still in hand and heaves a sigh of relief. Tinder chooses now to pop up as it congratulates our boy on his first standard gathering of materials. He gains three more contribution points alongside a 1.1% increase in the skillfulness of his harvesting skill. He quips that it has been a long time since he practiced and even feels like he is a little rusty. This is not the case at all. All the other harvesters have been staring and keep staring at Menkeo as he turns to look at them. He curses under his breath at the realization that he dissected the scorpion a little too quickly and vigorously. He thinks on his feet and readies to lie his ass off. Our boy tells his dad and uncles that he has a secret to let them in on. They all stare more intently this time, as if he's about to tell them the reason why God needed to rest on the seventh day. Once upon a time, a young Menkeo dreamt of becoming an ace harvester. Whenever his father went out to work, he would always practice hard in secret. He had diverted his attention as he grew up but got met with an unfortunate injury just a year ago. This helped him realize that his new dream to get into the university will not work out. So the young man became even more determined to pick up his former dream of becoming a harvester. He descended into a frenzy only to practice ten times harder than he did before. Influenced by his surroundings, he learned from his family, and ever since, he's been able to make the difference that his dad and uncles now see. The end. Our boy's audience believe every bit of his story and even have notes of praise to dole out on him. One of his uncles compliments his high school for making the difference, then others tell Mr. Lau that he's so lucky to have such a skilled successor. They proclaim that the man can later sit back and enjoy his future. Dumbfounded, our hero's dad complains to Meng Kao that he has never heard him mention anything about wanting to become a harvester. The line continues as our boy claims he never mentioned it because it felt too cheesy to admit that he idolized his own father. Mr. Lau, in turn, tells him that he knew he was being idolized whether his son mentioned it or not. They both strike a pose as one scratches his head shyly and the other beams with pride. They bump fists on the outside, but on the inside, Menkeo admits that his lie is just a foolish pass and his father admits how mature and skillful his son is. Sadly, he feels it's pitiful that he is useless as a father and can't help his son to become superhuman. All he can do is let him follow him at the bottom of the reaper circle. Our boy steals a glance at his father as he asks if they should continue harvesting. He places both hands on his hips and proudly declares that he has drawn the connection between his classes and the real thing. Our hero feels like he has found the right feeling for harvesting. His father solemnly agrees and they both dig in. As he goes about it, our hero admits that it's such a wonderful feeling, and as he places the nervous system cord in the solution, he quips that the feeling of harvesting he had gotten in his previous life has come back. Scalpel in hand, our boy stops himself from cutting any further. He gets wide-eyed after seeing something strange within the corpse, and even calls it an unexpected surprise. A quick analysis of the corpses of the giant yellow-tailed scorpion reveals that Menkeo could get 20,000 credits just from the nerve cords. The neurosphere could give him about 50,000 credits. Staring at the corpse, our boy wonders aloud whether it is a golden spirit. This surprises his father so much that he asks how our boy knows what a golden spirit is. He lies that it's something his biology teacher recently taught him. Next up, he calls out specific sizes of blades, bone-shattering hammers and bone exploration needles. He intertwines his fingers and stretches them out as he orders the preparation of some cooling and stabilizing liquid of a specific density. 
He then requests a dash of mithril be added to the solution since they might find high-grade materials from golden spirits and need to properly preserve them. One of the other harvesters discourages him from going forward, telling our boy that he should just await superintendent who to handle it. This quickly reminds our boy of the superintendent in question and how all golden spirit cases are either handled by him or a superhuman. Our hero touches an exposed portion of the golden spirit only to declare that their neurosphere and nerve cord have been exposed for too long. Building on this, he informs the others that if they wait any longer, the flesh will start changing, the spirit energy in it will run rampant, and it will most likely turn into an unpredictable bomb. His father then approaches to check out the fluid and confirms that it smells a little off. Mr. Lau's colleague laments about sample corruption not being their business, but any mistakes made during sample collection will lead to Mr. Who making their lives miserable. Staring at his reflection from a surgical blade, our boy resolves not to let the case go because his father's income is based on performance and a golden spirit is of such high value. He tells his uncles to take a break and then requests for his father's help, lying again that his biology teacher had taught him the way to dissect golden spirits. He already cuts open the scorpion's claw when his father holds back his hand, telling him to stop. Just then, another harvester wanted to interfere, only to get his hand stopped midair too. Mr. Lau yells that the golden spirit is his and that he will take the blame for anything that goes wrong. His face is so stern that you can tell his expression through all the gear. The colleague calls him a man fooling around with a child and then proceeds to quit. Mr. Lau remains unshaken. He even asks if the other harvesters want to go too, claiming that there's no need to be dragged down alongside him and his son. Our hero's father gets slapped across the face as the other harvester calls him Big Brother Meng and declares that they cannot let him take the blame alone because Meng Kao is also their son. He nudges Mr. Lau, telling him that they can handle one golden spirit even if they're not educated. The grown man is confused by the love and spins his head around to look at who's talking. The other harvesters end up hounding our boy's father, ruffling his hair as they jokingly threaten to share in the profits and also in the blame, no matter the situation. Meng Kao finds it quite touching but his response to this is to work harder. He picks up his scalpel, clamps, and surgical scissors as he begins the extraction process. He digs around until he comes across a golden orb. After that, he presents it to his dad with instructions to store it in a mithril-based cooling and stabilizing solution. Three harvesters exclaim at the same time when they the etherealized nerve ball. As the organ spreads in the storage solution, the harvesters continue explaining that it's at least 80% active and in perfect condition. They refuse to believe our boy got so good from just being in a key high school and even wonder if it's because of a girl. Our hero begins to examine the container and gets yelled at by his worried father. Mr. Lau warns him about recently removed etherealized neurospheres not being able to withstand heavy thermos. Meanwhile, our boy's curiosity doesn't quench. He realizes that there's something more valuable inside the ball. His father notices too and raises his hand in disbelief. One of the harvesters brings up Meng Kao's spine injury and the other rhetorically asks if the etherealized neurospheres won't serve a good healing remedy for our boy. This pushes Mr. Lau to clamp down the container, telling his son not to even think about using the ball. He calls it the spoils of war belonging to whoever risked his life to kill the monster. Our hero's father reminds him that they're just harvesting on the person's behalf. Mr. Lau seems to have a lot on his chest because he continues advising his boy about not taking other people's things no matter what. He brings back the injury incident and how hard it is on our hero. Worst of all is that Mr. Lau still feels useless for not being able to do anything else about it. Our hero is utterly misunderstood by his dad and twists his face into a helpless expression. He raises his hand, signaling his father to stop with the lecture and promises to head back to camp to have a quiet time. In truth, the only reason our boy wants to head back to camp is so he can persuade his father to start his own business. Having changed out of his previous outfit, Mankeo heads back to camp as promised. On his way down, he overhears a strange sound and immediately recognizes it to be the seven-eyed wolf spider. He begins to run like he's being chased, all in an attempt to obtain the corpse as the source of his first bucket of money. Upon arrival at the scene, our boy literally screeches to a stop. The entire place seems to be on fire with just two people, an old man and quite the young lady, approaching the scene of the killing. Our hero quickly takes cover behind a rock, lamenting that some people got to the scene ahead of him. A gray-haired man in a jumpsuit calls the girl beside him Zushi and commends her seven solutions. He then tells her that the seven-eyed wolf spider would be perfect for her to practice her skills. Zushi in turn calls this man her grandpa as she slaps on some gloves in preparation for the harvesting. The strange girl drops her cylinder of tools and it pops open like one of those automatic gift boxes before she claims that the harvest will take her only eight minutes. As she starts the dissection, our hero spies on her from behind the rock, wondering if she doesn't know the condition of the seven-eyed dragon wolf spider. Unable to just stand by, he yells at her to stop, causing both Sushi and her grandpa to turn their gazes at him. Our boy displays a symbol with his fingers before introducing himself as a harvester looking to start his own recovery resource company. The elderly man acknowledges that Meng Kao knows harvester etiquette. He calls out our boy's unprofessional behavior and asks why he would stop his granddaughter's harvest of the wolf spider. He shouldn't have asked because our hero breaks into a small speech and a bid to reply. 
He explains that the beast is an evolving seven-eyed dragon wolf spider stuck between rank 1 and rank 2 so its internal structure is very weak. Apparently, its poison sac is as thin as cicada's wings and once it's destroyed, all the materials will spoil. In conclusion, he tells them that if they use Zushi's method, the harvest will fail. With folded arms, the girl notices the trainee band on our boy's arm and blames it for Meng Keo not noticing Ming Shiwo, her grandpa's white hair ghost hand. Amidst the flames, Grandpa inquires if our hero has a mentor. What he really wants to know is how he could tell the beast's evolution just from watching. Meng Keo brings back his famous smirky smirk and brags about being self-taught. He even calls himself a veteran harvester. He then differentiates between the wolf spider and the dragon wolf spider by the difference in their screams before death, claiming it's not difficult. This last line has Grandpa's face in a knock. Zushi lashes out at our boy, calling him a lying newbie harvester. She claims that her grandpa who's a veteran didn't hear the difference so how could a newbie hear it? Our boy claps back, yelling that he never lied. Although the outside of the beast looks regular, many of the internal organs have started to mutate. He dares the old man to open the super beast and see for himself and he takes the bait just to confirm if our boy is lying. Grandpa retrieves the scalpel from Zushi and as she bows to hand over things, she angrily calls our boy a brat that's trying to ruin things for her. Even Grandpa calls our beloved hero a brat, telling him to watch closely if he wants to learn some skills. Mankeo is 100% ready and smiles as he gives Grandpa the go-ahead. The old man begins to shake after wielding two scalpels in both hands. His hands get so unsteady that it's obvious to our hero that Grandpa is injured. He blames the injury for giving Zushi the floor. With a maniacal smile across his lips, Mankeo concludes after seeing Grandpa's state that he has made his first bucket of gold. He walks up to Zushi and politely inquires if they have 300,000 in cash. She doesn't give an answer at first, just a disgusted look. She then asks him why he wants to know. Our boy explains that Grandpa has some vessel problems and definitely needs an assistant to finish up the operation or else the materials gotten will only be 30,000 with change. Hand to his chest, he declares that if they add his expertise, it can at least allow the most perfect poison sack which is also the most valuable, to be harvested. If they then add other materials, the worth may rise to about 100,000. He's too cocky as he declares that he will only bill them 30,000 and use it as a contribution to society. Zushi just stands there dumbfounded, looking at our boy as though he has been saying rubbish. She angrily informs him that her grandpa could be injured but is still the white-haired ghost hand. Even if he would need an assistant, she would rather it be herself than some brat who's just a trainee. She's about to continue talking down on Mankeo when her grandpa shuns her and calls her to come see for herself. Morbid is the word for how Grandpa Ning's face looked as he declares that our hero was right and has been telling the truth this whole time. Zhu stares at the beast's organs with confusion. She then complains that the organs are wrong and that the beast is not a seven-eyed wolf spider. Her grandpa agrees with the assessment and tells her that it's an evolving seven-eyed dragon wolf spider. On the inside, grandpa beats himself up for almost losing to a low-grade super beast that hasn't even reached the second level. As both grandpa and Zhu stare silently, Menkeo peels into their middle. It gets really awkward and our boy zips his mouth shut before the girl beside him slaps it. Reluctantly, she asks our hero to tell her what he wants. He just scratches his hair shyly as he calls the super beast a common occurrence and proclaims that it didn't go through any strange or unusual super evolution. The ease with which our boy spoke about something so difficult makes Grandpa and his girl feel like pounds of shame concrete were dropped on them. Zushi then asks if he can really complete the harvest for her grandfather at 300,000. Mr. Ning yells out 500,000 as he interrupts his granddaughter's negotiations for his own. He declares that if our boy can just help him out, even though it doesn't turn out perfect, he would immediately transfer 500,000 to him. All Grandpa wants is for the poison sack to retain at least 70% of its poison. Menkeo doesn't know when he smiles. He then tells Grandpa that his strength and senses are just average seeing as he isn't a superhuman. All our boy claims he can do is be Grandpa Ning's assistant. He heaves a sigh of relief inwardly. You see, our hero almost told Mr. Ning that he would guide him to finish the job. Grandpa agrees with the initial terms and announces Meng Keo as his first assistant and Zushi as the second. They all gear up in preparation and as soon as they begin, Grandpa calls out different instruments that he's in need of only to have our boy hand a different instrument over to him. He claims that the number 3 hilt with a number 12 pincer-shaped blade that Grandpa plans to use in separation of the book lung can be detrimental because it's an evolving monster with leaf-shaped wrinkles on its book lung. Our hero is only scared that Grandpa will ruin its appearance if he goes on with his plan so he creates another one for him. Our boy suggests that Grandpa begins from the vessel behind the book lung to separate the veins in reverse and tidy its surroundings before dealing with the main book lung. He then observes that the veins have become much sturdier than they were previously and asks the older man what he thinks. Grandpa Ning only has utter disbelief laced with confusion written all over his face. That's until he declares that he was thinking about the exact same thing our hero had said. Just then, Tinder pops up behind Grandpa Ning to congratulate our boy as usual. This time, for giving guidance to an elite citizen and improving the man's knowledge about the semi-matured dragon wolf spider. For his efforts, Tinder blesses him with 15 contribution points. This leaves our hero smiling ear to ear.
Orc begins to move swiftly and smoothly as they package organ after organ with no complication whatsoever. It's so blissful that Grandpa has to admit to himself that harvesting with Menkeo is super comfortable. He even wonders if he should teach our hero some of the seven dissection techniques. But first, he inquires about the kind of method our boy would use to extract a certain organ. Seeing that the floor is his, our hero gracefully explains that he would do it from below and along the central apophysis, using the seven dissection techniques in reverse and the three consecutive diagonal plucks as a wrap-up. Grandpa Ning's eyes grow wide with realization, for the boy before him is not ordinary. He has upgraded the seven dissection methods and saved himself at least 5% more time on every harvest. Grandpa's mind begins to question everything about our hero, from his identity, to who taught him, down to how and where he got his research and powers. Tinder pops up amidst Grandpa's buffering. It showcases that Menkeo helped the old man to understand the fourth dissection technique in relation to the seven techniques performed in reverse. He gets 55 contribution points as his reward and you can't see it but he wears a huge smile beneath his mask. He attributes it to the elite monster's learning ability, quipping that he just made a few motions and Grandpa understood them. Speaking of Grandpa, the man asks our hero whether his parents won't be mad at him for teaching such secret techniques. Our boy pauses as he thinks of what to say. He can't say he's self-taught because Grandpa is too experienced and would catch him on the spot so he goes with the jester technique. In this technique, Menkeo plays dumb, apologizing to Grandpa and admitting that he was just joking around. Our boy claims that he has enough problems of his own and cannot reveal his master as a result. Icing on the cake is when he quips that his non-existent master told him that skills need to be exchanged and for the rise of Dragon City, such skills just cannot stay hidden. Zushi immediately cuts in, asking with a sour face why he charged 300,000 in the first place. Our hero closes his eyes as though he's disappointed in the girl. He quips that she has misunderstood him although they just met. After that, he explains that the 300,000 is his startup capital that he plans to use to forge his own team so that he can achieve his goal of contributing to Dragon City. He then stares into the distance, reminding her that the money isn't for self-enjoyment but rather, it's the first spark for the civilization of Earth to flourish in the other world. Grandpa should be tired of being surprised by our boy but apparently, he isn't. He noticed the glint in Mankeo's eyes as he spoke of contributing to Dragon City and Grandpa admits to himself that there are so few young men with that kind of heart. Zushi hides her face in shame, having been too short-sighted to ever think that our boy had such aspirations. Anyway, our hero calls them back to work and promises to support the operation for the last poison sack. He then instructs Grandpa to please remove the nerve cord. Meanwhile in our boy's head, he wonders whether or not his father is done with harvesting on his end so he has to return soon enough. Grandpa follows our hero's guidance and extracts the last poison sack in no time. After enclosing it in a container, he asks his granddaughter how much they have in their account. She tells him it's around 800,000 and Grandpa Ning instructs her to send everything to Menkeo. Zushi may be shocked by this but not as much as our boy who immediately objects to this gesture, reminding the old man that 500,000 was the initial request. Grandpa shoots him a smile for the first time since they met. He proclaims that the technique our hero showed him is worth more than a few hundred thousand. If he didn't have to care for his injuries, Grandpa would have given out a lot more money. He just pleads with our boy to hold onto the token and promises to get back to him once he examines the materials. Menkeo gracefully accepts the request and admits that he also has some research about the other six dissection techniques performed in reverse. The only problem is that it'll take Grandpa at least a year and half to recover from his wounds. He then asks Mr. Ning for a chance to exchange their skills in the future. Another surprising look visits the old man's face as he wonders aloud how Menkeo knows about his wounds. Our boy breaks down the symptoms and concludes that the venom of the purple crowned Holly's viper has affected the ulnar nerve, radial nerve and the median nerves in Grandpa's hand. It even affected his eyes. Zushi almost bursts into tears as she lambasts our boy for saying that her grandfather would be healed when the ailment is obviously one with no cure. This confuses our hero, making him wonder if it's truly a terminal illness. Zushi looks up at him with hope, wanting to know if our boy can heal her grandfather. Menkeo hasn't answered when Tinder pops up asking if he would like to accept his first treatment type mission. It asks him to achieve it in a month and the reward would range from 200 to 2,000 points depending on Mr. Ning's recovery progress. He accepts the mission and tells Zushi that he can try to heal her grandfather. The only problem is how troublesome unknown snake venom is. Our hero claims that he may only be able to find some clues and Grandpa immediately tells him that it's good enough because the doctors have no clue on how to treat his current condition. Mr. Ning wonders how he can repay the debt because he thinks our hero will have to pull in his master for this. Something then comes to his mind. Plain-faced, the old man asks if our hero would be interested in siding with Thunder Squad for harvesting monster contracts. Our boy isn't sure so he respectfully diverts Grandpa's attention to the poison sack not having a long shelf life. He tells him that they'll talk again when they meet up at Wufu Road afterward. The terms are fine with Mr. Ning and at that moment, he transfers the $800,000 to Mengkeo's account. Our boy had only $24 before now, no way that was even a good start. 
As he tries to get back to his father, Mr. Ning tells his granddaughter that our hero is no simple man. He beckons her to try her best to befriend him and the girl agrees. He stares at his bank statement as he makes his way to the site. Our boy is full of hope, looking forward to his father's surprise when he shows him how much he got. Excitement turns into caution as our boy overhears Big Brother Shen telling his father that he has to pay a measly $280,000. Shen feeds on his chicken thigh carelessly as he asks if Mr. Lau even wants to work again. Ben Kao's father is drenched in sweat as he stares at the ground, glaring at the shattered container that used to hold the golden spirit. Meng asks his uncle Jua what had happened and gets told that his dad had gone in search of Shen so he could buy the etherealized nerve ball. He had called Shen to tell him about the golden spirit being harvested and Shen yelled at him over the phone, threatening that Mr. Hu would cripple him if any of the materials go bad. After the call, Mr. Lau had told his colleagues that he would simply return the golden spirit to Shen to handle. One of his colleagues had asked if he wanted to purchase it and another discourages him with the fact that Shen would not sell at a worker's price. His friend even says he can't afford it should he even get the worker's price but Mr. Lau is dead set on trying because it would help our boy get into the university. As it's his only hope, our hero's father trudges the night in search of big brother Shen. Present day and it's Shen that's yelling at Mr. Lau, asking him what he meant. He tries explaining that he wasn't the one who broke the container but the manager chooses to use violence, pushing Mr. Lau to the ground as he asks if he's implying that he broke it. With crumbs all over his lips, he continues yelling that Mr. Lau is calling him a liar and a conspirator. Our boy yells for his dad and helps him to his feet. Before interfering any further, he confirms from his father if he really broke the container. He gets told that they're all a bunch of bastards and not to mind them. Upon closer inspection, our boy finds oil stains similar to the one from Shen's chicken thigh on the shattered glass. After our boy comes to the conclusion that Big Brother Shen didn't hold the container properly, he bites his lip in annoyance. He then claims that they'll each pay half because of the rule accompanying a situation where no one can find the real culprit amongst two people. Shen mocks Menkeo with food mixed in with drool scattered all over his face, asking if he thinks a few words will offset the 100,000 per adventure there to pay for half. The manager taunts Mr. Lau, drawing closer to him and calling him greedy for wanting to take the material for himself. Shen accuses him of dropping the container, and then urges him to stop refusing to bear the responsibility. With his head still bowed, the manager slaps his face and continues to taunt him with the threat of never working again should this matter go public. Our hero's father could not bear to hear that last statement so he yells out that he tried to buy it with money. Shen piggybacks on this and requests that Mr. Lau sign a three-year contract as a second-grade contractor. He tells him to either take it or leave and then signals for one of his men to hand him the contract. With his lack of etiquette still intact, Big Brother Shen bursts out laughing before trying to sweet-talk Mr. Lau into a two-year contract with a promise of $10,000 in advance. He then suggests that our boy's dad gets him some nutrients so he can at least stand a chance at going to the university. Reluctantly, he agrees to sign the papers. The manager stretches the notepad bearing the contract with a smile much too mischievous on his face. Something suddenly gets into Menkeo and his eyes grow wide. He slaps away the notepad in a fit of rage before telling Brother Shen to stop dreaming. The notepad shatters immediately it hits the ground. Poor Uncle Shen gets so enraged that he tells Mr. Lau about his son having no respect for the law. He points towards our boy, signaling his thugs to throw him away. As they approach our hero, his father stands guard, yelling at both thugs not to harm his son. Our boy and the other harvesters just stare blankly until Mr. Lau gets punched with so much force that it shatters his headgear before impacting his cheek. Blood escapes his mouth as our boy stops him from falling. One of the thugs doesn't give them any breathing space as he whips Mankeo's shoulder with an electrified metal bat while he's still bearing the weight of carrying his father. His face turns red from the sharp pain. The veins on his head and neck pulsate, and he yells for the thug to get out of his way. As he yells, he accompanies it with the reckless bull technique and punches the thug in the chest with such strength that he's left coughing up blood. Thug number two interrupts as he electrocutes our hero from the side. This only infuriates the hero some more. He claws his fist, grabs the thug by his singlet, and flips him, sending the thug flying until he crashes into a rock. A golden ring appears round our hero as he tells Tinder to activate ripple force and push it to specialist level. Just like the name implies, a gust of wind begins to take shape as it encompasses Mankeo and spreads out. He walks closer and closer to Brother Shen, remembering how he also tricked his father into signing the dangerous second-level contract in his previous life. Our boy comes close enough to tower above the manager, making the man plead for a chance to talk it out. He slaps him so hard that betrayed spouses would pay anything to slap like that. Our hero tells Brother Shen to go talk with his ancestor's ass as the slap shatters every part of his helmet and sends him flying. Then Kao declares that it's for Shen changing the contract to avoid being sued in his past life. He gives the manager a follow-up slap and blood comes gushing out of his mouth and nostrils. This one is for Brother Shen holding Mr. Lau's insurance money just so he couldn't afford to pay for his injuries, also in his past life. 
Our boy is too pissed off to stop there. He punches Shen in the chest despite his face being swollen and his teeth falling out. The impact sends the big man Xia's rolling into all corners of his head and this punch is for brother Shen making Xiao lose faith in legal justice. Because of him, Xiao had chosen the dark route in their previous life. He finally ends things when he kicks the fat man into a nearby truck. The manager just laid there half dead, having peed his pants. A short while after, our boy stares at the manager and his anger seems to arise again. Lucky for the fat man, Mr. Lao stops his son in time, asking him if he wants to go to jail. Then Kao gets a hold of himself as he realizes that it's his father who stopped him. He quickly asks how the man is doing. His dad says he's fine but doesn't hesitate to return the question. The other harvesters and their crew then approach our hero as they call him impulsive and advise him that such impulses are easy to get out but hard to get back in. Meanwhile, both thugs help each other out in the corner. It becomes an internal battle as Meng Kao's angel and demon appear to give him their two cents. His angel claims that he's too reckless and should have waited until dark to beat up Brother Shen. His demon replies unapologetically that he already beat the man up and his angel begs him to stay calm at all times so he can remember who he is. With a maniacal smile, his demon suggests that they go and kick the manager a few more times to get their fill of beating the man up but the angel thinks our boy should stay a gentle and elegant high school student. Both our hero and his demon dismiss what his angel just said as he seeks to approach Brother Shen. His father stops him again, asking if he plans on killing the fat man. Our boy mutters under his breath as he admits that he's wrong. Unfortunately, he doesn't plan on changing today. All he wants is one more kick and promises repentance after it. His declaration of intent gets stopped by two strangers in capes, one blonde and the other, a redhead. The blonde happens to be Superintendent Gu Ming, a business executive of Prosperous Resource Recovery Company. Mr. Lao and other harvesters chorus this man's name in surprise. As for the redhead, he's known as Master Tiger but his real name is Kin Hu. This man is the big boss of the Resource Recovery Company. Our boy lets a frown fly as he acknowledges that the two troublemakers have arrived at the scene. As he is thinking about Gu Ming's position, the two thugs take a knee and welcome their bosses. In Meng Kao's previous life, the superintendent had done so many dirty things with Shen Rong Fa's help. As for Kin Hu, he had killed scores of monsters and earned the name Tiger down the mountain. One of the thugs successfully reiterates the turn of events to the superintendent, and he exclaims in surprise, yelling that our boy had not only damaged rare material but also destroyed a company computer and beat people up afterwards. Gu Ming crosses his arms as he blames Mr. Lao for his son's wrongdoings. He glances at our boy and returns his gaze to the superintendent, yelling that the argument is between him and the manager. He promises to pay the damages and fees for everything and reiterates that it has absolutely nothing to do with his son. Master Tiger stays calm as the other members of Lao's crew try to defend him. One spills that the manager's bodyguard was the first to hit people and another yells that the Golden Spirit incident may not even be their friend's fault. The last crew member mentions the Super Being Tower and the survival members of Parliament, asking if Dragon City doesn't have rules anymore. Gu Ming is furious and blames Shen in his heart for causing so much trouble. The superintendent regrets working for him and claims he wouldn't have if Mr. Who wasn't the fat man's brother-in-law. He tries sweeping everything else but Meng Kao's crimes under the rug as he comes face to face with our boy. He then reminds him that beating up people so badly will definitely rack up jail time and even ruin our hero's life. Mr. Lao yells at the superintendent from the back, telling him that he can't catch his son. Gu Ming turns to face the man, pointing at him and urging him to take a look at Brother Shen's injuries. In essence, the superintendent thinks there's nothing left to say. A smile creeps onto our hero's lips as he encourages his opposition to call the police and send Shen Rong Fa to the hospital to get his injuries scanned for their severity. This statement stumps Gu Ming as he admits to himself that our boy is pretty brave. Kin who immediately approaches Shen's half-dead body, lifting him off the ground for a chance to examine him. Master Tiger then discovers our hero's ripple technique had come into play. He explains what he thinks happened, from how the attack left Shen looking bad but also made him feel things worse than death without his bones or organs getting injured. Apparently, if you send the manager to the hospital, the scan would come out indicating a light injury. All the food crumbs around his mouth mixes with blood as Shen sweats profusely above ground. Master Tiger throws him at our boy out of disgust and Meng Kao calmly dodges it as he overhears the big boss call him a not-so-simple high schooler. This brings a smirk to our hero's face as he taunts Kin Hu, asking if he would like to beat up a high schooler to avenge his brother-in-law. The big boss is offended at how low our hero placed him but isn't going to act on it. Instead, he inquires of the boy's plans to resolve the issue at hand. Speaking of hands, our boy waves his, quipping that he thought Master Tiger would bypass the rules set by the Super Being Tower and survival members of Parliament to attack a normal boy like himself. On the outside, he puts up a brave front but on the inside, our boy is super suspicious of how Kin who easily recognized the future of his ripple skill. He thinks Master Tiger is gathering information about his skills and background, all while acting kind on the outside. 
Mankeo points to where the golden spirit laid spilled, declaring that fault cannot be clearly allotted in such an issue. He then repeats his suggestion for both sides to pay half and asks that they determine the price before he'll send whatever they require. Our boy digs up how Shen is still owing his father and other harvesters for their performance reward. He goes on to complain that none of them like the turn of those events and refuses to work at the resource recovery until all they are owed is calculated. His father and his crew wear a surprise looks like a celebrant with a birthday hat, while Master Tiger and the superintendent wear looks of boiling rage. Gu Ming is the first to break as he screams at the hero, asking him what he's saying. To him, our boy should have to pay for injuring someone so badly even if they cannot analyze the wounds. Meng Keo instantly claps back with mention of his father's injury. He then exposes the two thugs for using ancient martial arts on his father and wonders aloud that no one knows if his dad's heart got angina or his bones got damaged. Even Mr. Lao is shocked by that one, having never suspected ancient martial arts. To resume his defense, our boy lifts his shirt to reveal the spot he had gotten electrocuted and asks what would happen to his injury. From a frown, Master Tiger bursts into uncontrollable laughter and quips that the situation is interesting. Our hero gets lost by this man's reaction so much that he inquires how he proposes to resolve the situation. Master Tiger and Gu Ming then share knowing looks between each other before the superintendent breaks things down. He tells our hero that Mr. Who had marketed the etherealized nerve balls at $300,000 for the perfect grade. Master Tiger jumps in. First, he calls our boy a brat and escorts the insult with an offer to let them go if he can cough up the 300 k Then Kao stares him down but Mr. Who doesn't even care. He simply tells him that he can accept a credit note should our hero not be able to cough up the money. He then brags about not lacking anything. Obviously irritated, our boy stretches his phone towards Gu Ming to confirm a transfer of $300,000. The superintendent's phone dings as the money comes through and the alert sends him into shock. All the man can think about is how the brat had gotten so much money. Mr. Lao tries interrupting the situation but his son assures him that all of the money is clean and promises to help him all about it later. Our hero then confirms that the golden spirit now belongs to him since he had paid in full and Mr. Hu says he could care less about a mere etherealized nerve ball. Without hesitation, our boy picks up the golden spirit before asking his dad to help him make a silver nitrate solution. Afterwards, the golden spirit is dropped into said solution and it spritzes like a disturbed can of Sprite. Anyone could swear that all the blood left Gu Ming's face as he watches the golden spirit spritz until it reveals a crystallized neutralized nerve ball worth about a million dollars. As soon as Mr. Who hears a million dollars, he begins to boil, sending shivers down the spines of the superintendent and big brother Shen. Golden spirit in hand, our boy turns to break things down to his father. He explains how he had discovered something inside it during the harvest and wanted to research it out of curiosity. Our boy stares at the container with him as he reiterates his father telling him not to take what isn't his. He roped Mr. Gu into the matter, claiming that he knew something was within the golden spirit but let it go anyway. This only infuriates the boss some more and he turns to glare at the superintendent. Moving on, Menkeo tells them how he had tried to split ownership in half during their conflict with the manager because he wanted everyone to get a few thousand if it was really a crystallized neutralized nerve ball inside. If Mr. Who could burst from anger, this would be the time. Each glare he shoots his employees come with a worse feel to it. Since the boss rejected our hero's offer to split the bill in half, he had resolved to risk it. If he failed, he would have accepted his loss and if he won, which he did, he would have earned it fair and square. His dad and two other harvesters simultaneously have sighs of relief but the boss glares at our boy with his forehead vein almost popping on its own. He calls Menkeo an interesting high school student and promises to never forget him. He then tells our boy to quickly leave with his winnings. Mr. Lao Ming wraps his arm around his son, smiling even with his swollen cheek. As they turn to leave, Lao Lai of the 10th Harvest team tells them to wait and then asks what they plan to do after leaving. Our hero's father seeks to answer but Meng Keo cuts him off, explaining that they have found a new resource. Since they now have the startup capital, they've decided to get into the business themselves. This news intrigues Lao Lai so much that he asks to work with them if they'll have him. Our boy ponders his options. He didn't want to infuriate Mr. Hu seeing as the man is a super being, but he remembers that he already offended him so he resolves to throw caution to the wind. Our hero refuses to let a mere super being stop him from grasping his own fate. He then tells his uncle Lai that their resources are not lacking and that if three or more harvest teams want to come, there's enough work to accommodate all of them and even get them a better life. After hearing this, Lao Lai begins to pull his uniform and thanks Mr. Hu for taking care of him all this time. He gives a small speech about nothing lasting forever and promises to work until the end of the month. Seeing that two prominent harvesters have left Mr. Hu, some other harvesters entertain the thought of leaving too. If you don't know the number of veins in the human head, just look at Master Tiger because they're all popping out vividly as he admits to himself that our hero is trying to piss him off even more. He tries intimidating the boy by towering over him and threatening that he knows nothing about the outside world. Meng Keo just stares up with a blank expression because he knows that Master Tiger doesn't have the guts to beat a high schooler in front of so many witnesses. Mr. Hu on the other hand, wonders what kind of mentality our boy has and entertains the possibility that he may be dumb. 
Just then, Grandpa Ning announces his presence only to get yelled at by an enraged Master Tiger. It's now Gu Ming and Shen Rong Fa that stutter as they inform their boss that it's Ghost Hand Ning Shi Wo that had arrived. That doesn't surprise who as much as seeing Shen Yu Ping of the Thunder Combat Squad. Blessed with blue hair and a gait so majestic, royalty would falter in his presence. Yu Peng steps forward wielding an equally mesmerizing blade in his sheath. The great master tiger suddenly mellows into a cat and licks Peng's boot as he asks what brought him there. As the combat squad co-leader looks down, he calls Tiger by his real name, making him wag his tail like an excited, well, cat. Mr. Hu mellows down so much as he speaks about fighting alongside Yu Peng against the ferocious prosperous gold eagle the year before. Master Tiger begins to praise the co-leader's sword but gets cut off, no pun intended. Yu Peng had heard about Grandpa Ning's little friend and accompanied him to see if there's a chance they could work together. Mr. Hu really can't believe his eyes, ears, in fact, all his senses seem to be off. He stares in Meng Kao's direction only to see him and Grandpa Ning getting along over the crystallized neutralized nerve ball. His anger gets reawakened as he turns to glare at Gu Ming and Brother Shen, calling them pieces of trash that cannot even work properly. Our boy tells his father to leave with him so they can find a quiet place to discuss terms with Grandpa Ning and Yu Peng. Before he leaves, he remembers something and returns to track down Brother Shen. He finds him hiding away under a vehicle, crying like a child that walked into a gunfight. Our hero tells him to calm down and only asks for that which is his. You see, the manager had taken our boy's $10,000 gift card just to let him work a day in the recovery company. Since he's no longer working there, Meng Kao wants his gift card back. The fat man gasps as beads of sweat fall from his face. Zushi finds this funny but tries her best to hold back her laughter. Once again, Mr. Hu is the only person that is left angry. With hands shaking like a fish outside water, Big Brother Shen hands over our hero's gift card. As he swipes it from the fat man, our boy declares that everyone's insurance is now bought and paid for by the company. He takes it a step further and informs them that his dad and uncle will come by the next day to settle and calculate everything. He urges the company to prepare the document and his dad and uncle to read through properly so they don't get scammed. He shoots them the Namas pose as he warns Brother Shen that he will trouble him for the documents. Our hero then thanks Mr. Hu who's still mad by the way. This doesn't stop our boy and his people from leaving in their numbers. Immediately they leave. Master Tiger lifts Shen by the collar of his shirt, angrily questioning him about eating the insurance of his employer too. The fat man pleads for a chance to explain but gets all his teeth slapped out of his mouth instead. As they walk back, Grandpa Ning informs our boy of a youngster training camp that the Thunder Squad will be hosting and how he will need a few experienced harvesters from him to tackle the large amount of monsters that will be killed. Our boy doesn't answer, rather he asks a question of his own. He opens up about not having the means or connection to sell the crystallized neutralized nerve ball and asks Grandpa if he can help him. Coincidentally, there'll be a rare material trade in three days' time and Grandpa informs our boy of the possibility of a huge payout. That smirk we like so much returns to Meng Kao's face as he promises to be at the event. He then gets into the armored truck with his uncles and father, leaving Yu Peng, Sushi and Grandpa Ning to watch them as they drive off. On the ride back, our hero falls into a trance where he compares the contribution points he had gotten from teaching Chu Feixing the Reckless Bull and helping Grandpa learn the higher rank pluck technique. He just chucks it up to Feixing being younger and having more possibilities. This gives our hero quite the mischievous idea to find more youngsters to guide so he can get more distribution points. He even considers anonymously posting the reckless bull technique onto online websites. A yellow haze filters onto our hero's face as flashes of a pandemic in his past life come to him, one where people got attacked by a brain corpse worm, a reddish tentacled monster. The opposition even used it to kill Dragon City's most important member later in the war. This monster has the ability to possess the human brain by controlling the central nerve muscle. Flashes of people running up and down during the destruction interrupt our hero's trance. Unfortunately, the brain corpse worm is just one of the many mind-controlling monsters and our boy realizes that once word gets out about his abilities, they will capture him and try to read his mind. And if his secret is exposed, it'll put his entire family in danger too. He resolves then and there not to tell anybody about it until he had attained the power to suppress the world's evil. As he acknowledges that he needs an identity that can explain his powers, his father covers him with a blanket. This helps him finally wake up and the first thing he does is tell his dad about Tinder but calls it an online master. Mr. Lau listens to his son with rapt attention. It's too bad that he's been lied to. Our boy goes on about his so-called online master teaching him many things. He claims his wound is almost completely healed and that his parents can sit back and relax because he will definitely pass his examination when the time comes. All our hero has been saying flew right over his father's head. The only thing that stuck was the mention of an online master. His father is super worried that his son had visited those unhealthy websites and he doesn't hide it. Mankeo grabs his head helplessly as he tries to change his father's opinion on life forum and biology forum websites. He lets him know that they both have their benefits and risks. Our boy puts his dad's mind at ease, reassuring the man that he won't get scammed like last time. 
This helps his father dismiss his worry. He then commends his son's performance and expresses more worry over Master Tiger coming to take revenge. Mankea winks at his father and accompanies it with a thumbs up as he tells him not to worry. He rhetorically asks his dad if Kin Hu would be bold enough to attack him when he passes and has the university as his background. Our boy gets his hair ruffled before getting sent to bed early under the grounds that he has school the next day. Tinder does its thing, popping up out of nowhere to announce that Sayo's darkness has been decreased by another 2%. Our boy gets blessed with 200 contribution points but that's not his priority. Internally, he throws quite the tantrum, flipping an imaginary table as he complains about his sister's darkness reducing by only 5% in total. He had stopped his mother from getting injured, his dad from getting scammed, and all of this only dented her darkness. He admits that his sister must be a natural-born demon. It's a bright new day but our hero isn't quite feeling it. He yawns and trudges himself to school that morning, only to get ambushed by his friends. They begin to fill him in on everything he missed because he left school early the day before. Apparently, he missed out on their learning group. Faixing had taught them more parts of the reckless bull technique, and his red-headed friend is particularly hyped up about it. He claims that he practiced twice the day before and felt an increase in his strength, so much so that he feels like he can kill a monster with just one punch. Mankeo doesn't know which way to look as all his friends strike different poses. They reiterate that he needed to be there because the whole school seems to have caught the reckless bull virus. Soon enough, our boy is left out and he watches the craze go on as his friends blame Wang Tao for single-handedly spearheading the reckless bull debacle. Having finally made his way to class, our hero pulls a chair for himself. He heaves a sigh of relief but before he can settle in, his fellow student barges into the classroom with alarming news. It turns out that word of their study group made its way to the head teacher Wang Zhang's ears and now, he's talking to Chu Feixing about cancelling the group. All the students present have their jaws dropped by the information, including our boy. He then stares at Zuo Hyorin who wasn't moved at all. An evil smile warms its way onto our hero's lips as he hatches a plan to both save Feixing and implicate the class rep. The table has never suffered such wrath until our boy slams his palm against it in anger. He yells as he asks who could be such a crazy and wicked bastard. A classmate of his follows up as she too wants to know who would be so wicked as to ruin the chances of everyone improving their skills. Our hero balls his fist before switching to analysis mode. He announces that almost everyone in their class had joined the group so nobody would report him or herself. Moving on to Feixing, he also declares that he's much too honest and innocent to have conflict with anyone. The thought of him hitting someone hard enough to make the person lose comes to mind, but would said person report our chubby friend? Menkeo's hand makes its way to his chin as he continues to ponder this. Wang Tao is the first to call out the class rep for having a conflict with Fat Bear. He asks him why he must ruin everyone's chance to improve themselves. Our boy's two other friends continue pressing Zuo Heorin for being so wicked. The class rep buried his gaze in a book until he can no longer do so. He shuts the book emphatically and turns to face our hero. Zuo Heorin only yells that our boy shouldn't frame him but trusts Menkeo to piggyback on this statement to frame the class rep even more. He claims that he didn't mention names and Zuo had no need to admit to the crime. The rep almost loses himself but calms down just in time to give his classmates a speech. He tells them not to listen to the hero's nonsense and reiterates that he never told the teacher anything. He goes on to say that the cancellation is, in fact, a good thing, because Feixing's reckless bull technique is so strong that it could drain all their energy. He then calls it a cursed skill. This scheming punk admits in his heart that he unintentionally told the head teacher exactly what he just told the students. As the students begin to wear unsure looks, Zuo Heorin reinforces his speech with talk of their examiner checking them more strictly. He explains that they must all learn the correct way since learning from others could be seen as cheating and even warrant cancellation of results. The cherry on top is him asking the students if they would rather gamble with their exams. Yet again, Wang Tao confronts the class rep, wanting to know how he's sure that Feixing's technique is cursed. Zuo breaks into another speech about researching the technique and discovering that it was gotten from the internet. He describes how dangerous internet skills could be before pointing out that Meng Kao should know what he's talking about. Our hero simply keeps an expressionless face as the class rep blames him for giving Feixing the internet account and website that led him down the wrong path. Tinder pops up amidst their conversation with news of the head teacher learning a portion of the reckless bull technique, 30% to be exact. Apparently, teacher Wang's combat ability and knowledge increase so he will teach more students and they too will get stronger. Tinder adds 50 contribution points for our boy, congratulating him for contributing to the increase in the overall safety of Dragon City. Menkeo stays quiet about it but acknowledges to himself that the class rep cannot get his reputation back after this. He tells Zuo Heorin to put the blame on him and if Feixing doesn't host the study group later, he also gives the class permission to scold him. Both his friends are surprised by how easily our boy gave up and refuses to believe it. The door slams open, revealing a confused Feixing. The boy walks straight up to his best friend and begins to whisper into his ear, telling him about the head teacher's interest in the reckless bull technique. Teacher Wang wants to spread the technique to the whole class but our chubby friend couldn't decide because he felt like it was the hero's choice to make. 
Immediately he asks what our boy thinks. Menkeo yells about the teacher actually canceling the study group, misleading Zuoheoran on purpose. The unknowing class rep quickly seizes the opportunity to tell the class that cultivation has no shortcut, and that only hard work and effort can bring them success. He has his hand in the air as he urges the students to forget about the reckless bull technique and join him to work hard with the remaining free days. Our boy chooses now to tell the entire class the truth about Teacher Wang wanting to spread the technique and this pierces Zuo Heoran's heart like an arrow shot by the elves themselves. The teacher steps in at that moment and meets the rep's hand still in the air. This makes him ask what the problem is, but before Zuo can answer, our hero interrupts him with an apology to the teacher. Both the class rep and Feixing are confused by this debacle but watch as Meng Keo continues. Teacher Wang asks why our boy is apologizing and he explains that Feixing wanted to host a reckless bull study group but is now regretting it because he feels it's too profound. He lies that his best friend feels hasn't learned it enough to teach it to others and has even asked him to think of a way to convince people not to learn the technique. The hero claims that he thinks Feixing was right and that he came up with a stupid idea about a fake technique he had gotten from the internet. Teacher Wang and the class rep stay staring at our boy with utter confusion spelled on their faces. This does not deter him as he laments about falling for the technique last year and luring his innocent, trusting friend into telling his classmates about it. He wonders aloud which trash bastard, idiotic dumbass that eats but doesn't shit, amongst other elaborate names, would leak such information to a teacher. Zuo Heorin just stands there as our boy's words hurt him for the second time in that hour. It takes Teacher Wang's efforts to get the hero to watch his language. He then places his hand on his chest as he fakes a modest apology and claims that he said all those things only because he was mad at himself. Apparently, everyone knows how wise he usually is and that he would never say such things normally. The head teacher has heard enough so he signals our boy to cut it out before proceeding to tell everyone that Reckless Bull is definitely an authentic foundational skill. He buttresses that all the kids need is a teacher to guide them and tells them to ease up and learn it. Celebration is the order of the day as smiles lace the faces of all the kids. That's until Meng Keo lifts his hand to say something. The hero explains that the class representatives usually get additional cultivation resources as compensation for their time and effort spent managing the class. He points out that Feixing gave guidance to everyone and so did half of the class rep's work. All our boy wants is for Zuo Heorin to give half of the resources to Feixing. The teacher is dumbfounded so the hero turns to Wang Tao and Gu Fang for support but doesn't get any. Gu Fang later summons the courage to call the class rep selfish and when he doesn't respond, our boy yells that his back is stiff as a popsicle in winter. Zuo can't take it anymore and it's his turn to slam the table like it offended him. He declares that if splitting the resources helps the class then he has nothing to say. The hero has to be the worst because he nudges his best friend to quickly thank the class rep. Feixing doesn't get what is going on but the rep tells him that he deserves the resources and even urges him to accept. On the inside, Zuo Heorin is boiling with so much rage and the only person he blames is Meng Keo. He hates that he took away half of the resources that his uncle had tried so hard to get for him. The class finally goes quiet as head teacher Wang breaks down what three things the kids will have to do to pass the main subject. First, they would have to undergo a physical test that would be held on school grounds. They would check the limit of each student's fist power, their speed in a 100-meter sprint, and their shooting skill. The downside is that the school has only 150 slots for this test. Secondly, they would test the mental spirit of those who made it through, using the Super Brain Virtual System at the Educational Bureau. Students would get plugged into the system in a state of stasis as they battle mentally. Third and most important is the Extreme Combat Battle Exam. Here, the survivors will be made to go to the city's edge, near the mist, as their true battlefield. Teacher Wang then advises his students that the road to becoming a super being is extremely dangerous, and that those who aren't geniuses might as well give it a rest and focus on the specialized exams. One of his students objects to his logic, raising his hand and spewing that everything he said wasn't fair. The student poses a situation where he does badly in the 100-meter sprint but could have done much better in the combat exam if given the chance. Tables must have collectively done something wrong because Teacher Wang slams his this time, telling the student that the world is never fair. He then reiterates how Dragon City had nothing when they first got transported to this new world but had to face monsters and zombies anyway. He asks the student if he thinks the zombies or monsters will treat them fairly. He doesn't give the kid time to answer as he explains that super beings are high up in the food chain and are blessed with all sorts of authority that doesn't come freely. He makes sure his students understand that they have to fight tooth and nail to obtain these powers from the demons and monsters. Our hero shakes in his seat but it's difficult to tell if it's out of annoyance or plain fear. Anyway, Teacher Wang goes on about fairness and gives his student one more tip for free. He informs them that the injuries and death rate from participants of this year's exam are twice as much as the year before but anyone who gets disabled or killed will get proper compensation. Meng Keo can't help but think that the government must have sent something since they want to nurture more super beings to combat the evolving monsters. As Teacher Wang arranges the file in his hands, he advises those who aren't of optimum combat ability not to take the main exam seeing as it'll be a true battle. 
He then heads for the door, but before he leaves, he urges the students to visit the test room to take a look at their combat ability. The head teacher discourages those that don't possess the Earth Era's sprint champion speed and the Fist King's punch weight from trying out because they obviously will not pass the school's inner exam. The rest of the class chatters and complains amongst themselves but our boy just sits retrospectively, with both his hands intertwined beneath his chin. As instructed, all the students head towards the test room and sadly gather behind the 100-meter race track. It's so bad that Teacher Wang has to tell them not to be depressed and even presents them with some good news to lighten the mood. Luckily, all the students need to do is pass the school's exam and whoever passes gets blessed with twice the cultivation resources as the year before. In response, the students chant the city's mantra to use their swords and fists to make Dragon City great again. With a tap of his hands, Teacher Wang signals the start of the test and tells the students to disperse. Our boy seems to be the least worried as he stretches carelessly at the back. Feixing, on the other hand, is busy empathizing with a student who complains about having a ton of monsters attack their area. The boy couldn't sleep and laments about not being able to unleash his full strength. His friend also complains about spraining his leg the day before and thinks that he will only make it 10 seconds into the 100-meter sprint. Luckily for their circle, they have a voice of reason who whips both boys into shape telling them how smart and perceptive they are. He then declares that they do not have to act like losers. The voice of reason watches as the one who complained about having no sleep hits a 233.3 kg mark on the punching machine and calls him a liar because the result was easily top 5. As for the one who sprained his ankle, he made the 100 meter sprint in 9.57 seconds and sent the voice of reason spitting out blood in utter surprise. He exclaims that his friend has broken Earth Era's short sprint record and feels stupid for believing his previous story. As a recompense, he tells his friend that he'll be treating the whole class to bubble tea. On the flip side, Menkeo just stands back observing the ladies with big melons as they sweat it out. He declares that truly this is youth. After the 233.3 kg mark, Feixing beats it with an extra 0.2 kg and Wang Tao flashes our chubby friend a thumbs up, calling him Earth's new boxer king. Feixing is nothing if not shy. He laughs nervously, looking at the ground like he has no idea how to knot his shoelaces. The most surprised person present is the one with the score sheet in his hands. Teacher Wang couldn't explain it but notices that all the students who had been part of the study group all have increased scores. This only reinforces the effectiveness of the reckless bull technique. Our boy stands before the punching machine but is distracted by people celebrating Feixing in the distance. His attention gets called back when Zuo Heoren calls him trash. The class rep bitterly goes on about Feixing breaking a record passing the main subject, and even becoming a super being. His point is that Mankeo will never be Feixing. He tells him that his friend will soar high but our boy will forever remain trash. Our hero just stares blankly at the class rep and his childish excuse for trash talk. In his previous life, he had challenged Zuo Heoren to a duel after getting the same trash talk. Unfortunately, his wounds were not totally healed and the rep pulled out a dangerous skill that severely injured the hero. The wound had persisted until the day of his exam and led to him failing it. Back to the present and our boy does all he can to not be bothered by the class rep's words. He even clicks a pen in his pocket to divert his attention while the other students continue with their tests, running and punching away. Zuo Heoren then tells the hero to stop daydreaming that he'll pass the main subject and tells him to try again next time. With such innocence, Feixing waves at his best friend, yelling that he made a new record. Meanwhile, the class rep tells him that it's his turn and sarcastically adds that he has everyone's support. Our boy just glances at the bespectacled hater as he taps his back. Mankeo shakes off the nervousness with dead set eyes and an announcement that it's his turn. His nemesis urges the students to cheer our boy on because he's about to test the 100 meters run. They really encourage the hero, telling him not to fail class 6 and that he can get into a higher vocational college if he just puts in the work. Our boy admits to himself that the class rep is really a ghost but announces that everyone should stop encouraging him because he was fighting monsters in the neighborhood the day before and is very weak at the moment. He informs them amidst a frown that he can only exert 50% of his strength. Wang Tao doesn't care. He continues to cheer on Meng Kao, promising to teach him the reckless bull force in their afternoon self-study class. A smug Zuo Heoren quips that everyone knows the hero's condition and advises him to defeat himself. The class rep claims that our boy shouldn't think of comparing himself to other students but be a little bit stronger than himself. Legs against the kickoff pads, our hero mutters that his body is much too weak to handle the reckless bull force but he's been using ripple force to treat his wounds for a year now, so he decides to use that instead. A blue essence begins to encompass the hero, accompanied with a gust of wind that fills the class rep with painful realization. Our boy tells him to move out of his way as he's about to move. Imagine a NASCAR revving past you on a windy day, now imagine you're Zuo Heoren. The class rep doesn't have time to regain himself as the hero's speed sends his hair and glasses floating in the air. He had run so fast that Zuo Heoren had to do everything in his power to stay in place. Our boy easily beats the previous record, creating a new one of 8.57 seconds. Somehow, this is still not enough for him. He laments that his body is still too weak and that he couldn't even surpass Usain Bolt's record. The hero feels unworthy of getting into college in that state. 
all the victims of his speed stare at him with ruffled hair as they try to process what they just witnessed. It gets weird so our boy asks them what the problem is. Only Fiction questions his speed and our boy continues lamenting that he knows he's pretty slow. His friend gets super mad when the hero claims that his sloth angers him too. You see, Fiction cannot be deceived. He can tell that our boy is pretending and it infuriates him even more. Teacher Wang comes calling as he confirms if Meng Kao's wounds have healed. The hero stretches some more, and then tells the teacher that he's not at 100% but has been practicing Ripple Force really hard over the last year. He explains that he found new styles and learned from them. An opportunity presents itself and our boy grabs it with both hands, asking the teacher if he wants to learn the technique as well. All the hero wants in return is anything ranging from gene medicine to high-grade nutritional fluid, down to cell growth fluid or even monster materials. He smiles so warmly that you would think he has anything other than money on his mind. Wang Tao acknowledges that this is the second force execution technique that has been upgraded and concludes that because of this, the scores of the entire class are bound to soar. Faixing tests the hero as he asks if his punching is as good as his running. Meng Kao immediately debunks that idea, admitting that his punching strength is sloppy and average. He stretches again, reminding everyone of his adventure with his dad and claiming that he'll just have to try his best. The other students begin to debate our boy's punching strength but he gets to it before they finish talking. With such marvelous yellow essence surrounding him, our boy punches the machine and they all watch as it rises from 120 kg to 150 kg before finally settling at 218 kg. As some students lament about not having time mentally prepare for this surprise, Wang Tao realizes that the hero has a degree in pretending to be weak. Another student yells in the distance that their champion from the year before has returned. Contrarily, Meng Kao is disappointed that he could only hit the same punching force as Mike Tyson and feels like he's still too weak. He turns to Feixing, defending himself that he didn't lie to him. The straw that breaks the camel's back is when our boy claims his punches are really weak and bear no strength at all. This pushes Feixing to ask Teacher Wang's permission to hit Meng Kao and the funny thing is that he's just the first in line. Meng Kao pulls out his greatest defense as Feixing and the others hound him, promising to get each of them a milk tea. They all immediately mellow down after this. A tired teacher Wang swipes his hand across his face and promises to pay for the milk tea because our boy's family situation is kind of complicated. Or so the teacher thinks. The hero smiles shyly as he informs the teacher that he can handle the bill himself because he earned some money from harvesting with his father the day before. The only problem he has is with Suo Hao Ran who has been embarrassing our boy from time to time. Well, a fed up Meng Kao angrily asks for a chance to settle things once and for all. He then turns to innocently plead with Teacher Wang to seek justice for the class rep yelling at him. The head teacher is nothing if not mortified. He thinks to himself that our boy feels he's still in kindergarten. He then stutters as he tells him that there's no need for all the justice talk. As he adjusts his glasses, the rep claims that he was just trying to motivate our hero and although his tone was a little stern, he was just doing it for his own good. With tears in his eyes, our boy clicks a pen and begins to replay the harsh words of Zuo Hao Ran from when he told the hero that he'll forever be trashed to when he told him to think about college in his next life. Wang Tao, his friend, and the head teacher all have their jaws dropped in surprise. Gu Feng is filled with disappointment as to how the class rep could be such a person. Teacher Wang then asks if our hero had really come to school with a recording pen. But before he's done talking, Zuo Hao Ran cuts him off with some yelling of his own. The class rep shouts that Meng Kao is framing him. He tells everyone not to believe him, and asks who would bring a recording pen to school on a daily basis. After his denial, the rep lets a mischievous smile fly. Unknown to him, two can play that game. Our boy fakes some tears, claiming that he had to learn his lesson after being humiliated and cursed day in and day out. He goes on to tell everybody that the rep has been holding a grudge since he beat him during their first year of high school. It turns out that Zuo even cursed our hero behind his back when he got injured during his second high school year. His eyes water and go red and he balls his fist in a pain he's not even feeling as he declares that on some days, the class rep says worse things than what he recorded. Zuo never saw this coming. In his head, it's practically chaos because he racks at trying to remember when he had committed all these allegations that our hero put against him. The rep then declares that Meng Kao is just throwing dirt on his name and declares the same to his classmates. The floor is now for our boy. He begins to lament about the reason he had gone to the internet in search of the ripple force technique, admitting that it's because he's a hot-blooded man with a backbone. He declares that even if he dies, he will stand up and walk with dignity before Zuo Hao ran. Apparently, the major reason why he never told the teacher or anyone about his curiosity, or failure, was because he was scared that he would mess things up with the fighting method and drop deeper into the abyss again. Worst of all, that he would get mocked by the class rep and called trash forever. An already annoyed Feixing shares his anger with Wang Tao as they both declare that the rep has been doing too much. 
The head teacher, on the other hand, just stands by speechless. To show his resolve, the hero shatters the recording pen, saying he knows that the class rep didn't mention any names on tape and has the teaching director as his uncle so he definitely won't get justice with just the tapes anyway. Moreover, our boy doesn't like seeking justice through such methods. Fat Bear loses the color in his cheeks as he tries coming to terms with his best friend breaking key evidence just like that. With a stern look, the hero throws what's left of the broken pen at Zuo Hao Ran, challenging him to a duel once again. The rep is shocked and barely dodges the pen's carcass. His eyes grow wide as he inquires whether his opponent wants to be the class rep instead. Nankeo displays a little smirk and declares that he doesn't care about the outcome as long as Zuo gets removed from the position. Out of worry, Teacher Wang tries calling our boy to order but he has thought everything out already. He eases his teacher's mind by telling him that their duel will be the first of the three college tests the week after. Our hero suggests that they compare their overall results since that isn't against the rules. The rep finally accepts the challenge and after this, Teacher Wang announces that the class should train on their own for the time being. He then called the class rep aside. As Zuo crosses shoulders with his nemesis, he warns him not to claim that he's bullying him when the time comes. He threatens him to go and practice his gun technique with the one week remaining. Our boy then watches as the rep leaves with Teacher Wang. The other students draw closer to the hero. Wang Tao calls the class rep a crafty person because he never knew all the things Meng Kao had gone through in the past. Some other student warns our boy of the shooting section of the tests, stating that the hero could win the first time but the shooting would really pose a problem. Gu Fang then adds that Zuo Hao Ran is a member of the Falcon Gun Club and practices there every weekend. She tells our boy that he was too reckless this time. Unbefitting of the situation, the hero bursts out smiling. He assures everyone that his gun technique is pretty good, and if he wants to brag, it's bordering on perfect. The perverted hands of a teenager reach out in an attempt to grab our beloved Gu Feng, but she runs from them, yelling that they shouldn't come any closer. Unfortunately, these hands belong to Meng Kao and he explains that all he wants to do is help her adjust her muscles. Upon hearing this, Fei excitedly asks for help with his muscles, only for our boy to blatantly reject him. That afternoon, self-study class ended up being a failure. The hero was really looking forward to helping his mates study but none of them thought his intentions were good. This makes him wonder if he looks like a bad person. Naturally, he would have to touch every muscle in order to help with muscle stimulation but it can easily be misconstrued for something else. He resolves to find new ways to make contributions lest he still be injured by the time of the test. His hand wraps itself around the shoulder of his best friend as our hero whispers for Feiching to follow him so he can tell him something. Our chubby friend easily agrees and in no time, they arrive at the racetrack. The first thing our boy does is advise his friend to learn more about the reckless bull force from Mr. Yan. Feixing isn't settled. He turns to face our boy, asking if they will not be exposed if he goes to the teacher for guidance. As you know, Meng Kao has thought out everything. He lifts his index as he states that the first reason for his suggestion is that Mr. Yan comes from the military and communicating with him will leave him no choice but to see Feixing in a new light. This will ultimately lead to him having an easier life in the military. The middle finger joins the index as he explains his second reason. Our boy has been searching for a way to cripple his opponent so he needs to find someone who's as strong as the teaching director also known as Zuo's uncle. Feixing begins to yell but our boy is fast enough to hold his friend's mouth shut, pleading with him to stay quiet and listen. His hand on chin pose makes a comeback as he suggests they teach their techniques to the higher-ups rather than letting them come and steal it. Because their class incident cannot be concealed, our hero decides to manipulate the situation to get into the principal and Mr. Yan's good books and also earn some benefits from them. An expressionless head rests upon Feixing's neck as he, in turn, suggests that the hero joins him in search of Mr. Yan, and afterwards, follows him to military school. Meng Kao frowns at that instant, describing how much the military and their strictness does not suit him, unlike Feixing who Mr. Yan can teach the hard way and it'll actually turn out nice. Another thing on the hero's list is to find a ripple expert. Immediately he says this, our chubby friend loses his senses. Love shows in his eyes as he talks about Ripple Princess Yi Fei Rong and how she's specialized in teaching teenagers beginner Ripple. Of course he would think that she's a better teacher than Mr. Yan and even Teacher Wang. Our boy's mischievous smile is much too wide and his eyes sparkle with flames of a scheme. He remembers that the future Yi Fei Rong becomes the Ripple Queen after a thousand practices and a lot of hard work. For now, she's still weak and young and the hero thinks she will need him to guide her. Feixing is disappointed and tells his friend that his smile is so wretched. As a clapback, Meng Kao asks why his friend knows so much about the Ripple Princess after claiming that Ripple is a technique for sisses. Feixing blushes with all of his being. If you had looked at him from the sky, you would see a big red dot. He tells our boy that he should know why already. Guess who's obsessed with the Ripple Princess? And goes as far as opening a fake account to get her attention. That's right, our hero. He tries to message her directly but doesn't have the courage. Worse off, he gets carried away reading the comments from internet testifiers. He had chosen to use Tinder Old Man as his handle, advising one of Yi Fei Rong's followers who had complained about not understanding her breathing technique, to breathe at the center. Equipped that his breathing rate also has room for improvement. 
This other fan has a name much too long but he testifies about how he used Ripple Princess's technique to wear down a poisonous three-headed lizard. Old Tinderman advises this fan to run with Ripple if he ever meets any of such lizards with a red shooting stripe because he can forget winning against it. It has been established that the Ripple Princess has fans with handles much too long, but this one testifies of an increase in his fist and unleash rate since he started taking her guidance. Of course, the old Tinderman has something to say too. He tells the fan that it's not bad but there's still a big room for improvement. Our boy then offers to give free guidance since he's in such a good mood. Ife Ron goes live on her platform and all the comments lambast the hero for trying to ruin reputations and for using tricks to try and obtain fame. They all want him to be ignored and even kicked out if possible. Old man Tinder later drops a statement for people like this, pleading with them not to misunderstand him. He explains that he's not trying to hide himself nor is he picking on the Ripple Princess. All he's trying to do is to contribute to society so that more people can increase their combat ability. In real life, the whole social media shebang is stressing out Meng Kao. He tiredly squints at his phone as he declares that he's been talking to a bunch of people that know nothing. The thought to make his messages private comes to mind but he can't do that because Yifei wronged him. He then continues to brainstorm different ways to get the princess to notice him. Money answereth all things and the old Tinder man knows it. He splurges on the princess, buying her a million spacecraft worth $10,000. When the notification comes through Yifei Rong's phone, she shrieks in surprise but her fans go on about how rich people know how to play this game of leaving a lasting impression on people's hearts. The Ripple Princess is still in shock but she and her melons take a bow, publicly thanking old man Tinder for supporting her. She quips that she's not perfect, yet but hopes for a cancer to research and grow with everybody. She does this on the steam room, where she restricts everyone from commenting. An unknowing faction cries in his bathroom, lamenting that rich people can really do whatever they want no matter where they are. Meanwhile, Xiao finds it really suspicious that her brother could buy such a gift for the Ripple Princess. She thinks it weird, strange, and any other word that would describe how unnatural it is. She presses herself lightly against Mankeo's door in a bid to discover what her brother was thinking, sending three months worth of a family's living cost. Xiao gets weirded out by what she witnesses as our boy grabs a piece of meat and practices his Ripple technique on it. To say his little sister is worried would be understating it. She resolves in that moment to tell their parents to talk with her brother. Our boy is too busy reiterating how he had written out everything he understands about the ripple technique and even recording a video of him crushing pig meat into mincemeat. Xiao watches with fear as the hero declares that he will get Yifei Rong's contribution points. The princess is out for a run when her colleagues stop her to give some fan love. They tell her that her fame has increased by 15% and that teacher Wang's streaming lesson is less popular than hers. She smiles modestly, explaining that the two cannot be compared since teacher Wang deals with an upgraded rank unleash method, a method not many people can understand so she'll naturally have more citizens on her side. One of the fans tells her that their martial research group leader will be treating them to some food and encourages her to stop by for the community friends that will be there. She promises to stop by and requests that they tell the leader about her having to arrange her room. The buzzing of her phone draws the princess's attention. As she walks back she notices that the message came from old Tinderman. She reads it aloud and it's about people claiming changes to their ripple and since he already gave her a $10,000 gift, he decides to also add the first 30 seconds of the formula that would help her use the ripple unleash method that everyone's talking about. It takes her some time to notice but she finally realizes that what he wrote actually has meanings to them. Realization turns into shock as she asks the thin air how this is possible. She takes a moment to breathe, clasping her phone against her chest. After this, she calls up Senior Zhao, begging him to tell the leader that she cannot attend the night's event. She asks that he lie about something urgent coming up and even come see her because she has something to show him. Filtering light from the street lamps touches the princess's skin with a light glow. She rests against the street lamp until Senior Zhao arrives. Without wasting time, Fei Rong shows him the message old man Tinder had sent to her, only for the senior to be initially confused. He admits that the formula guidance process is right and that our boy's way of thinking is quite unique. What worries the princess the most is that the old Tinder man pointed out the flaws in her current ripple technique and he was right about them. Zhao becomes curious about who sent her the formula and all she does is show him the video attached to it. It's a clip of Menkeo and a cat mascot head, experimenting with meat and tofu. As they watch it happen, Zhao has to admit that the hero's control is scary because it took him so little time to disintegrate the meat, all while maintaining the tofu in the same state on his other hand. He declares that the hero is already an expert. It's Fei Rong's turn to talk and she finds it scary that his skill combines about seven to eight family ripple essences that have never been heard of before. Zhao realizes that our boy must want something in return for the formula and asks the princess what it is. She's just as confused as the next guy, but she tells her senior that the hero had only requested that she doesn't keep the ripple technique to herself and to share his version of the technique so that people of Dragon City can grow stronger. Her senior is worried. He exclaims that it's indeed a big matter. He then suggests that Fei Rong tell their master about it and she agrees without wasting time. She's left with her thoughts and the only thing that peruses them is who old man Tinder could be. 
On that cool night, Menkeo and his dad stand side by side on the balcony. His father tells him that he can really become the family pillar when he grows up, and our boy just smiles sheepishly. Mr. Meng's mind is troubled as thoughts of his wife burdening him with the duty of talking to their son clearly flashes through his mind. He gathers some courage and brings up how Zio Kao had seen the hero's things and told his wife who, in turn, related to him. The man gives his son the option of not listening to the advice he wants to give him but our boy insists on hearing it. It gets as awkward as seeing someone you ghosted online, in real life. They stare at each other with nothing but silence between them and this continues until Mr. Meng sparks up a cigarette. He claims that he will keep his speech short. He blows out some smoke as he declares that our boy needs to focus on cultivating since his exams are close by and after that, he can bring home any girl that he likes. His dad promises to support him and then moves on to the matter of Dragon City having a bad environment. Immediately he tells his son to take note of hygiene and safety protocol, this man vanishes into thin air. He vanished so fast that our boy had no chance to ask any questions. This leaves him wondering what his sister must have told his mom. Tinder distracts his thoughts with news of Ife Rong achieving some understanding of Ripple, and blesses him with 99 contribution points. It quips that she's shocked by its effectiveness and will spread the new version to more and more normal citizens who will learn this new version and gain more progress in the way of understanding. Tears roll down the hero's eyes as he proclaims that he has finally found a way to use Tinder. While he's in his feelings, contribution points pour in like the likes on a thirst trap. From then on, Tinder old man gains some clout and this leaves our boy that he can't explain how the current him knows martial art and high-class techniques from the future but only understands half of many of them. He then resolves to find a way to create a mysterious expert character so he can push everything on the expert as a logical explanation for his knowledge. The new goal is to spread old man Tinder's name far and wide so that his words will be believable by the masses. Mr. and Mrs. Meng stand right outside our hero's room as weird noises emanate from it. His mom yells that he should at least lock the door, while his father declares amidst tears that this is what youth is. Meanwhile, all our boy is doing is lounging on his chair and wondering what characteristics to give old man Tinder. He has a light bulb moment to give it deviant characteristics that prove that he's not just strong but also cuckoo when it comes to cultivation. As the hero works on the profile, so much excitement leaks from his person. He tells someone on the internet that his hundred sword skill is quite good but has flaws and weaknesses. He then offers to guide the person since he's in a good mood from killing a super beast with a thunderbolt. The next online victim gets a life threat from old man Tinder all because he argued with him. Our boy had told the person that he wouldn't live to see the next day, had he not taken a few years to relax. No, he doesn't stop there. He barges into a shooting skill group chat and calls all 17 shooting skills trash before finally putting out a request for someone to help him test his upgraded ripple technique. The hero goes to bed smiling, happy that his plan to push all the attention to old man Tinder is working. He mischievously admits to himself that his online trolling is a flex and run situation that he finds quite entertaining. Tinder doesn't let him rest from notifications of additional contribution points showing up like flies on an open jar of honey. His eyes glisten as the thought of accumulating 3,000 points brings joy to his heart. He concludes that first, he needs to get some sleep. Early the next day, the dim sunlight flows onto the Fei building and within it, the Ripple Princess asks her father if the demonic changed Ripple is strong. The well-chiseled man affirms it and says it has to be, because the Ripple Princess believed it. Fei Rong is distraught that her father thinks she's being lied to and asks if he thinks the skill is fake. He says it's not fake but it's very extreme and crazy. You know things have escalated when your dad starts giving you parables. Fei Rong's father quips that leading by half a step in an era is genius but leading by a whole step in an era is crazy. The quote doesn't apply to our boy who Mr. Fei thinks is a crazy manic who is three whole steps ahead of this era. The Ripple Princess tries insisting that the skill is effective but her stern father asks if she's trying to say that the manic's surface data is stronger than their own Ripple. He reminds her that the technique uses 20% oxygen as a price and lightly knocks her head, telling her to use her brain and think. Mr. Fei lets her know that 20% oxygen exhaustion can change a lot, ranging from stance to cultivation resource and even the whole cultivation style. He hates that a good foundational system got changed into some weird nonsense. Contrarily, his daughter doesn't think it's rubbish. Her father admits that he gets scared every time he practices the new ripple and declares that the maker must be a mad demon. He realizes that the technique was made for a more crucial era, one where people will need ten times their power to defeat more ferocious monsters. He calls it a useless dragon slaughter technique because it will ruin their reputation and make everyone else take a piece of their family's hard-earned ripple. Fei Rong informs her father that the new version is already spreading on various groups and forums, and asks what should be done about it, and whether they need to ask her grandpa for instructions. Mr. Rong tells her that her grandpa is still locked up, cultivating, and tells her to do an upgraded version but test it before sending it out. He then tells her to instruct Group 24 to continuously send out said new version for the next few days, and not to disturb her grandfather with such minor details. Yi Fei Rong bows her head, and as her anger broods, she prays for our boy's safety that she doesn't catch him. Well then folks, this is where I'm going to end this episode. 
It has been my longest single video upload so far, and I was working on it for many days. I hope you guys enjoyed the story and want to see more of it in the future. If so, please let me know in the comments below. If the response is good, I'll be sure to pick it as a regular series after the sect leader. Anyways, stay blessed, and I'll see you guys very soon. Until next time.